started. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Clapp. I'm Arlington's Conservation Administrator. The February 1st, 2024 meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in a remote format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023 to extend the remote meeting participation of public meetings until the 31st of March 2025. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. I will put the link to all of the meeting materials into the chat right now. All right. Chuck Taroni, our Conservation Commission Chair, shall facilitate tonight's meeting. Please note that there will be a brief comment period for each hearing. Each vote taken during this meeting will be conducted via a roll call vote, and we will begin with a roll call of attendance. Uh, Nathaniel Stevens? Present. Susan Chapnick. Present. Mike Gildeskane. Here. Uh, David Kaplan. I'm here. I'm searching for who I missed. Oh, uh, David White. David White, thank you. Sorry, okay. David White. And, and the dog. And Brian um, McBride. And Brian McBride. Thank you. Andrew. Brian McBride. Here. Present. Okay. And so we also have Lane Coleman as associate uh, member of the commission and Here. Sarah Alfaro Franco. Present. I, I, said that. I couldn't see the rest. Yeah. So we're, uh, uh, the commission is all here. And uh, I'll go over the agenda first. And then we'll proceed to our first uh, administrative review of minutes. Um, so the first thing on the agenda would be the minutes. And then we have correspondence. And I'm just going to read those into the record. And if you want to read the entire uh, letter or email that the Conservation Commission received, uh, Ryan um, Cap will put a uh, link in the, uh, in the uh, chat. And uh, you'll be able to go there. So. Um, Bird Coogan, uh, 11, uh, 17 Eden Street, uh, about Thorndike Place, a coalition to save uh, Mugar wetlands, uh, sent two, uh, uh, one and two, both from uh, Thorndike Place. And then we re received one from Janet Cummings, and uh, Janet was from 32 Dorothy Road, uh, Lane, um, Elaine, uh, where are you? oh, Elaine Light right there, 53 Dorothy Road. That was also about uh, Thorndike Place. Lisa Friedman uh, at 63 Mott Street, Thorndike Place. And Peter Fiore, uh, 58 Mott Street, Thorndike Place. A lot of these had um, pictures of flooding. So if you're interested in uh, knowing about what the extent of flooding during um, the rainstorm was, uh, these pictures uh, can show that. So moving on from that, we're going to have a proposed amphibian restoration project. And then the commission will talk about some Eagle Scout projects that um, has once been proposed, but we might have some other ones to add to our list. And the Water Bodies Working Group, for we discuss the annual report and the SWCA contract, Park and Recs Commission liaison report, artificial turf uh, liaison report, and then Scott uh, Horsley, um, hydrogeologist analysis. Uh, he's from Water Resource Consultant. We'll we'll talk about um, the Thorndike Place projects, and then from that we will go right into our hearings. And the first hearing would be Thorndike Place. The second hearing would be 51 Birch Street. Third hearing would be uh, an amendment to the order of conditions for the Ellington Reservoir. And then a uh, request for determination for, 50, uh, for 35 Beverly Road. Um, ADA Coolidge has continued to our next meeting. So I don't expect to hear from them. With that, we are going to jump right into the minutes. And Nathaniel Stephen has his hands raised. Get yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a procedural question. Just on the agenda, I believe if uh, Scott Horsley is going to be speaking about Thorndike Place, that should be within the hearing for the Thorndike Place matter. It shouldn't be a separate agenda item. Sure. And 
It just it's Wait. listed before the hearings opening on the agenda. And I just wanted to I assume that you were gonna open the agenda for Thorndike Place and so that's your uh, suggestion. We open the hearing and then let's go Scott Horsley speak. That yes. sounds fine. Yeah. Understood. Thanks. Okay. Minutes. Review the minutes. I know there were some comments from Nathaniel Stevens and Susan Chapnick, so I'm not sure if they're going to narrate their comments when they come up. So I had a question here. This is in the 43 Beverly Road determination. And I don't remember what dates we landed on in the meeting because we did have a discussion about this, whether it should be between November 15th and May 1st or November 15th and April 15th. And um, I thought maybe Ryan Clapp could tell us because he got the determination out. What does it say? Uh, I haven't gotten the determination out the door quite yet. Oh, so, okay. Uh, I believe you're actually right that it was April 15th, though. Yeah, I think we had that discussion and decided it would be April 15th. And then I just added a bullet about um, Sarah's update from the tree committee because that was just mistakenly left off the minutes. So I'd, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes as edited. Oh, second. Okay, so moving right along, um, let's take a vote now. So uh, let's go with David Kaplan. Yes. David White? Yes. Mike Kildas game? Yes. Susan Chapnick? Yes. Brian McBride? I'll abstain because I wasn't present. And Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. And the chair says yes. Moving on to the next agenda item. We have a proposal for amphibian restoration project by Katja. <laughs> Could you, uh, hi, um, sure. Could you uh, introduce yourself to the commission? And uh, I don't know if you're sharing sc your screen to give a presentation, but uh, introduce yourself and then just uh, get, get right into what your, uh, your presentation, please. Of course. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Katya Kwaku, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Connecticut. I'm studying ecology and evolution. I did my master's at Tufts and I'm from Boston, so I'm kind of familiar with the area already. And I do have a presentation if I'm able to share my screen. Oh yeah, it seems like I can. All right, so my research is on how urbanization affects amphibians. And my main project is I'm trying to see what limits wood frog distributions in urban areas. Um, I've given this presentation to David Morgan. Um, so this figure is from Milford, Connecticut, uh, along an urban to rural gradient that's defined by a forest fragmentation index, so combining forest cover and road density. 
And it seems like spring peepers do pretty well, regardless of level of urbanization, but wood frogs are pretty sensitive. And people have said maybe this is because spring peepers have greater habitat flexibility, but wood frogs are forest specialists, or maybe wood frogs aren't in urban areas because they can't get there and they're dispersal limited. Whereas spring peepers are generally better dispersers. They climb trees, so maybe they could climb fences and are just more adept at navigating the urban landscape. And so to see if it's dispersal limitation or poor habitat quality, my project is to remove dispersal barriers by performing reintroductions of wood frogs to urban ponds uh, to see if we can restore their populations. And this might seem like a kind of shocking experiment to do, but people have done this in Milford, Connecticut and in Bangor, Maine. And they found no difference in larval survival or performance between urban and rural ponds. If anything, the urban larvae or tadpoles actually did a bit better. So I'm trying to repeat this experiment, but then also tracking the frogs even through their terrestrial stages and tracking them throughout their life. And maybe there's something to do with the terrestrial habitat quality that isn't quite great. Um, but we're gonna put them in ponds that we think are suitable. And so I have this pretty ambitious project where I'm trying to replicate it in four different cities so I can see if my results are just a, a city attribute or not. So in Arlington, uh, your ponds would be the urban ones and then just a bit west of here in Weston and there's one in Wayland would be the source ponds. And I've talked with their conservation commission and they're on board and think it's pretty cool. And so I would take some wood frog eggs and I'm also hoping to do this with spring peepers, but I know spring peepers are, their eggs are much harder to find. So this is in an ideal world. Um, get eggs from both species, enclose some uh, in Weston and Wayland and put some of them in some ponds in Arlington and measure their survival. And I've started this already in Milford, Connecticut last year and did a little test run with wood frogs. And so you can kind of see how it works where there are wood frog eggs and I get some of them. If there aren't many wood frog eggs in the pond, I take way fewer so that I don't take all the eggs in the pond and I count them and I move them to these egg enclosures that are Tupperwares with mesh on the side so water can come in with floats. And then once they're hatchlings, I count them again and then move them to these larval enclosures that are made out of uh, fiberglass window screening. And so I count them at each of those stages to get an idea of larval survival. And I take photos of them to see their growth. And then to track them as after they metamorphose, um, once they're close to metamorphosis, I can put them in this bath of calcine, which is commonly used to batch mark fish, but it's recently been used in wood frogs as well. And it's pretty cool if you do this at the right time of metamorphosis, um, it goes into their ossifying tissue. And then later, if you have a black light, you can see the mark in some of their bones and their parietal bones and their foot bones. And so that's how I'm hoping to track them and find them throughout uh, their life. And then of course, once they're mature enough, if the restoration is successful, hopefully they'll be calling. Um, and so these are my predicted results. If there's indeed something wrong with the terrestrial habitat quality in urban areas, uh, wood frogs wouldn't do as well as the rural frogs or the spring peepers. But if we are right and wood frogs aren't in urban areas because they can't get there and they're dispersal limited, uh, these restoration efforts should be successful, which is important because if it's 
poor habitat quality, we are going to want to go with some more terrestrial habitat, uh, more, I mean, more traditional habitat restoration uh, management plans. But if they're dispersal limited, we might want to take more aggressive conservation measures and perform more reintroductions or just ensure that there are corridors between suitable habitat patches. Um, and so that is the main project I'm presenting. But another part is just uh, seeing how urban and rural ponds differ in their characteristics. And so that's me in a uh, pond in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. Uh, at Mount Auburn Cemetery, they don't think that the wood frogs would do super well there, but they're still excited for me to help them monitor their ponds. Um, and then on the right is a pond in Wayland. And I just measure all of these characteristics. So I would measure these in Arlington as I'm doing uh, the reintroduction project as well. And these are my predictions for urban ponds compared to rural ones. And based on my pilot data and some other sites, like in Milford, as expected, it already seems like the water temperature and conductivity is higher in urban ponds, uh, which is interesting because eventually I also want to see if amphibians show local adaptations to urban ponds. So the amphibians that are there, have they uh, evolved greater tolerance to higher temperatures or high salt concentrations. Um, and so I would do common garden experiments where I put these animals from urban and rural environments in a common environment to see if the differences uh, are maintained and if they're genetic potentially. And so David and I talked about some potential ponds that I could do this in in Arlington. Um, I know Arlington doesn't have any certified vernal pools, but there seem to be some uh, potential ones that look suitable. So there's one at Monotony Rocks Park that I've been to a few times. Um, it seems like it dries in the summer and I've seen some juvenile green frogs around, which is promising. It seems like it's suitable for amphibians. There seems to be a small offshoot, uh, a small pond next to the Arlington Reservoir. And then um, there's kind of a Phragmites marsh at McLennan Park, but along the edge where it's not dominated by the reed, uh, seems like it could be suitable for wood frogs around there, or sometimes there are flooded areas closer to the trail, um, although I'm not sure how long those stay flooded for. And then by Meadowbrook Park, there are parts of the of the brook seem to expand and flood out a bit and create some wetlands that seem like they could be suitable for wood frogs or spring creepers there. And so those were the four places I was thinking of. Um, you let me know your thoughts. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um... I'm going to turn this over to the commission in a second, but I was, uh, my first question I came up with was um, these areas, not all of them belong to the Conservation Commission. Did you reach out to other departments and ask, could you let me know, shaking your head, um, Anatomy Rocks Park, was that, um, is that something that uh, you received permission to do this experiment at? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. I. So I believe um, all of them except for Meadowbrook Park are owned by the Conservation Commission, but I could also, oh, the the Parks and Recreation Service. Park and Recreation. Yeah, Park and Rec. Okay. Park and Rec. A lot of them are owned by the Park and Rec. Um, okay, are they all and Monotomy. Okay. Meadowbrook is the conservation. And okay, got it. The res also would be uh, would be park and rec. Okay, I think it. So I'll have to get permission from them as well. Sure. Um, Susan Chapnick has her hand up. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Chuck. 
Um, wow, this is very aggressive, Katya. Um, you're doing lots of different things. I'm wondering when you actually get into it, if you might focus down a bit because you're looking at urban and rural differences in, you know, adaptations and water quality and different nutrients. And then you're also looking at survival and, um, you know, whether it's dispersal that they're just not there or whether it's habitat. There's just so many things going on. I'm just wondering if it's too much. That's something for you and your professors who, who your advisors to decide. But it's very aggressive and you're obviously very passionate about it, which is awesome. I do have a few few comments. Um, uh, one of them is, is um, I guess you've done this maybe as a pilot, but it seems to me there would be potential for predation on the eggs. And how do you, you know, control for that? and also the larval stages. And then I was wondering if there are any other competing species when you start introducing a species to an ecosystem, as you probably know, um, mm -hmm. there's competition. And how do you know if they you know, survive, are they out competing something else that would have taken that niche? Um, it's just another question I had. Um, um, yeah, so in terms of the predation in the enclosures, uh, last year the the egg bins uh, originally didn't have covers on them because we need enough light uh, so that the eggs don't get moldy. They need lots of UV light. Um, just in one pond, it seemed like maybe ducks ate a bunch of them. Um, and so this year we're going to put... Uh, some garden fencing over it to mm. just in case um, there are any like large predators like that, but it would still ensure enough light to get in. And mm. then once in the larval enclosures in the cylindrical uh, window screening, they're closed off so predators don't get in um, because their main predators would be uh, dragonflies laying eggs in their larvae eat the wood frog eggs. Um, and I do want to keep them protected from predators because even though there are predators in the environment and it's natural because they're in this enclosed environment and they can't really escape or swim away, um, I want to keep them protected. And then in terms of competition with other organisms, um, it seems like most of the ponds I am putting them in don't already have amphibians. And so I don't think that would be an issue if there are, like I said, the juvenile green frogs or green frogs, they kind of uh, have different niches than the wood frogs and spring peepers uh, where they are, the green frogs are in the more permanent bodies of water than the wood frogs and spring peepers. And so I don't think there's much competition between the two. Hmm. And then my my final, and this, this may just come up when you go to Park and Rec. Park and Rec yeah. is doing a project, um, proposing a project to redo a playground area, naturalized playground area. And it looked like I couldn't quite tell where you were pointing. Um, in uh, near near Hills Pond, it wasn't the pond, but it was in Renata and Roxy. I yeah. think that might be the same area yeah. okay. that Park and Rec is looking at the playground, and we've asked them to stay, you know, at least fifty feet away from there. But that might have an impact if they do construction near the area where you're introducing organisms. <clears throat> Just something to ask them um, when you go ask permission. Good to know. Thank you. Sure. Thank I think you. it would be interesting to have a um, vernal pool in that spot. And the closest they're getting is 25 feet. They're a lot closer than 50 feet. There's a restoration oh, okay. area with uh, walking right. stepping stones. Right. Um, You're right, Chuck. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. David White. And um, we're we just want to keep things moving tonight. So I just want to make that comment about when um, 
we're at 14 minutes already on this project. So if just, if you can not ask a question that's already been asked, thanks. Okay. I just got to mention that the um, pond next to the reservoir is actually constructed the wetland that was put in when the dam was reconstructed. So, and it has water channel from the Mill Brook into the pond area. So it's... David, David mentioned that um, I, it's not a problem if it's uh, like an artificial pond, but I was yeah. wondering, do you think are, are fish able to get into there? David said he doesn't think so, but that would be a problem. So, sometimes the water overflows from Mill Brook. Overflows. I'm not sure if there's fish there or not, but it does overflow right. from Mill Brook. Okay. Okay. Uh, David Kaplan. Thank you. Um, this is an excellent presentation. Thank you for that. Um, the work sounds really interesting and exciting. I have no issues with it um, from uh, the Wetlands Protection Act or the bylaw perspective. So good luck. And, uh, you know, pending permissions, I would. I would support the work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brian McBride. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you consider the, uh, I guess it's called Infinity Pond in the Arlington's Great Meadows. I know that's a, a genuine uh, vernal pond and it does have a lot of peepers, but I don't know if it's on your radar or not. Just thought I'd mention oh, that. Oh, I have not. So it's called Infinity Pond? No, I think so. David White might correct Infinity me. Infinity Pond, yes. The Northern Edge near the Christian Academy. Yeah, there, it's a, it's crazy in the springtime. There's just a, it's like a jungle with different frogs calling there. It's a very nice little pool. Thanks. I'll look into that. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, what's your next steps? Um, you know, after you come to the conservation commission, uh, some of the ponds that you mentioned, I was concerned that they had frogs in them because. You know, any any pond that has a frog in it has a different kind of life cycle, and their predation on wood frog eggs would be high with those frogs. And and I think you said you were worried about dragonflies, and I think you're talking about Reeves Brook right there because it's probably a pretty big uh, area for dragonflies. But what, first, what are your next steps from the Conservation Commission? Um. So after the conservation commission if i will get permission from uh the parks and rec department the massachusetts division of fisheries and wildlife has already approved of the project um i would go there in march and make sure that there are no <laughs> wood frogs or spring peepers already there i I I did a, like a bit of um, scoping around last year, and I don't think that there are, but I would verify that. And then, I mean, if there are dragonflies and such, that's that's fine since they would be protected within the egg and larval enclosures. Um, and it's actually like important for there to be dragonflies because once the adults once they're adults, then they eat the dragonflies. Um, it's just as they're tadpoles, the dragonfly larvae will eat them. And I think in the wild, um, the pond is bigger than the enclosures. And so sure, some of the, there would be some predation by dragonfly larvae, but hopefully the tadpoles, some of them would be able to swim away and escape. Sure. Any other questions from the commission? Any motions from the commission about this project? Motion to approve. A second. Oh, second. Discussion. Um, just, I would be interested in your coming back and presenting us with your findings uh, when when that happens. Yeah, yes. definitely. Just the findings. Yes. All right. Uh, we have motion. We have a second. I think. Um, Let's go down, run down the roll call. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. 
Mike Gildas game. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. The chair says yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for that presentation. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck, Katya. Thank you. All right. So it's seven thirty. I think that uh, we'll just suspend discussion at this point and move right into our first um, our first item on the hearings. And so I want to open the hearing for Thorndike Place. Uh, but before we hear from the applicant, David White. I'm leaving. I'm recusing myself. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, David White's going to recuse himself from this hearing. Um, and um, so before we hear from the applicant and our third party review, I'm going to invite Scott Horsley to uh, talk about uh, talk about his um, I guess his I guess so Scott Horsley is a consultant for water resources and he's a hydrogeologist uh, analysis on the Thorndike place and Scott you're online right now you can do a better job than I can introducing yourself and please <laughs> take it from here excuse right, me you. Mr. Tyrone Tyrone uh, pardon me, Mr. Taroni, uh, Stephanie Keeper, if I if I may just interject as a point of order. Um, Mr. Horsley um, has not been uh, retained by the commission as a peer reviewer, and I think it should be clear within the public hearing process that he's been retained by um, someone who opposes the project, the Arlington Land Trust. Um, likewise, this is a, a little bit unusual, I would say, to have um, an opponent's representative um, op um begin a continued public hearing rather than the usual course within a public hearing in which the applicant, or in this case, you may want to have your peer review provide theirs, the applicant, and then open the public hearing up to comments from abutters and the public, which I believe that Mr. Horsley is probably a representative of a member of the public. I would refer to Nathaniel Stevens for a reply Nathaniel, you'd like to. Uh, sure. I, I would uh, agree with uh, Stephanie that it would be unusual to have the uh, uh, someone providing public comment uh, first before we hear from the applicant. And I, yeah, I, I do agree also that we should clarify that who uh, Scott Horsley is speaking for and what his role is. But I think she made that clear. <laughs> so I think that point's covered. But I might, sure. I might suggest that we hear from the applicant and. and our peer reviewer, and then as part of the public comment period, um, have Scott Horsley speak. And I think uh, I think we should all remember that we had, I think the commission had uh, agreed to provide a little more time than we usually allow for public comments for him since he's speaking for several people um, or a group of people. But, and, and we had scheduled that earlier, the applicant had requested to continue that hearing. So we're, so we uh, postponed his presentation as well. Okay, so we'll open up the hearing. We'll hear from the applicants, consultants, and then our peer reviewer, and then we'll open it up for public comment. And that's when Scott Horsley will uh, review what he submitted to the commission on behalf of, uh, and Scott, can you help me with that? Who did you do your work for? It's the Arlington Land Trust. Okay, so it's on the record that Scott has presented a uh, paper for the Arlington Land Trust, and so we'll we'll take it from there. So if there, are, I see one more hand, um, Susan Chapnick. Sorry, Chuck. Um, from my point of view, from my edification, it would make more sense to me as a commissioner to hear from our the town's peer reviewer first and then hear from the applicant in terms of response to the town's peer reviewer, because that's what we requested, the peer review, and then go into public comment, um, if that's okay with you. I would support that. Yeah, that would be, that sounds fine. Okay, so we're going to hear from our peer review, then the applicant, and then open it up to public comments. So, <clears throat> Our peer review is Hatch, it's uh, Duke Bisco, Rob uh, 
Keneally and Chris uh, Gormley. And are they here? Um, it's actually yeah. um, <clears throat> it's actually Ross Mullen. This is Duke Bitsko with Hatch. Um, we put together yes. the peer review uh, two weeks ago. Commission uh, Chairman. Sure. Is it? So uh, it's Ross Mullen who is the stormwater engineer. Is Ross on okay. right now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, as Mr. Visco was saying, my name is Ross Mullen. I'm a water resources engineer here at Hatch. I completed a third party review on behalf of the Conservation Commission here at the initial request of David Morgan for the project. Um, just to recap the project, make sure it's fresh in everyone's mind. Uh, the applicant is proposing to develop a 17.7 .7 acre parcel. Um, disturbing four acres in the process and creating just under two acres of impervious surfaces. Um, yeah, I think I think everyone here maybe has access to this memo that I'm, I'm just highlighting the, the, the finer points on, at the beginning then. Um, the, uh, the, the, the largest structure in the proposed development is uh, senior senior housing. Um, there are additionally um, five or six, excuse me, townhomes um, that are proposed as well. The applicant primarily plans on using infiltration as their primary mechanism for stormwater treatment at the site. Um, we completed a review uh, with respect to the 10 standards listed in the Man Massachusetts Stormwater Manual. Overall, um, I, I think my comments can be boiled down into just a couple of categories related to groundwater intrusion. Um, I, I have some concerns related to observed ground and monitored groundwater levels. Um, those, the elevations of the, the groundwater table being inconsistent with the wetland uh, elevation that's on site, as well as the risk of groundwater intrusion into the proposed uh, townhome structures through their, their basements. Um, the applicant is proposing to make the bottom of the finished floor below what they have identified as the groundwater table, by so the, the finished basement elevations are uh, proposed of the townhomes are proposed to be at an elevation of three feet mean sea level, which is generally consistent with what I've seen for the observed water surface in the wetland. Um, and the applicant has stated that the groundwater level that they believe should be used for the site is at four feet. So I have some concerns about flooding of the basements of the structures. I on, on a similar note, I have some uh, concerns about the effectiveness of the infiltration devices that are used, are proposed to be used on the site and their separation from groundwater in order to remove pollutants like TSS as documented in standard four. You need to have separation between the groundwater and then the BMP device itself, the infiltration chamber, so that um, that water can, can seep through the soil column and provide the, the adequate water quality treatment. And then finally, I think I have a, um, some concern on surface flooding that the applicant has, has, res has responded to, to um, separately. And, and I, we may have resolved this, but um, the senior uh, living build, building is proposed to be constructed below FEMA's regulatory flood elevation, or excuse me, the parking underground parking garage of that building is below FEMA's 100 year flood elevation. Um, prior to March of 2023, that was uh, forbidden under federal law. Um, it, although this, a lot of times local and state jurisdictions have looked, um, looked away in those instances. Uh, now FEMA does allow that, but there, there are some requirements for, uh, demonstration that adequate flood protection is provided and FEMA strongly encourages um, any any structure that's built below the 100 year flood elevation even if it is an underground garage um, to be built into quote unquote natural ground as opposed to separated from the floodplain by a fill which they they figure constitutes in um, a functional levy so Again, the highlights of my review, uh, overall, the applicant has demonstrated uh, compliance with most of the standards. However, I have some concerns about groundwater intrusion into basements, 
groundwater levels, limiting water quality, treatment effectiveness, and surface flooding into the senior living building. Thank you, Ross. Um, I see that Nathaniel has his hand up. I'll take that, Nathaniel. Thanks, Chuck. Um, thanks, Ross, for the presentation. I just had a couple of questions about your letter. It wasn't um, clear to me. Did you actually uh, verify that the first stormwater standard two that the that the peak rate um, discharge pre and post construction are that that standard is met by that by that measurement? Um, we we did look at that. That's a great question. Uh, we felt that the applicant uh, was complying with pre and post construction rates for the design storms. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then your first bullet though was a little confusing because you say uh, the uh, where is it? The infiltration rates uh, were selected were on the edge of the published values for uh, soil group C. Yeah, this is pretty common. Um, another good question. So broadly speaking, hydrologic soil groups are divided into these lettered soil classifications where A is the highest infiltration rate on the one hand, and D is the lowest infiltration rate, highest runoff on the other. The applicants um, demonst demonstrated that the hydrologic soil group, soil group of the site was sort of right on that BC line. Um, mm -hmm. And at the surface, they called it a C, which is to say a lower infiltration rate, higher runoff in subgrade. They, they actually use more consistent with a B, um, so slightly higher infiltration. Uh, we we see this a lot, and, and generally it's it's appropriate. Um, you do get surface compaction um, at ground level, so using that lower rate uh, at the ground level and slightly higher below that is, is, is acceptable and okay. Okay, all right. So your overall conclusion is that they do comply with standard two? Um, related to rate control, yes. Related to flooding, I have some concerns still. Okay, thanks for that clarification. And also, I guess if you could just clarify vis-a-vis -vis standard four, where what you think about that. Is that overall, or do they comply with part of it, some of it? Do you need more information to determine whether they comply? It just wasn't clear. Um, I, I would like more information uh, to, to make that assessment. Okay. They, uh, they, they comply based on the, the information they provided, but those the groundwater levels they provided um, range from a half a foot below sea level to four feet above. And that's, it's just, it's, a, it's another thing where it's right on the edge. Um, and, and we really want, I, I would like a bit more data. And is that, in your experience, is it typical or for a site to have such a variation in terms of ground level of uh, groundwater level observations between the observation points, as they seem to be suggesting is the case here? Um, yeah, th this can happen. Um, I, I, I think separately, the commission has a habitat review that's ongoing. I, I would be interested in seeing the mean annual high water level that comes out of the wetland um, delineations and studies and, and comparing that to the groundwater elevations that were observed. Generally, you see strong relationships between wetland water surface elevations and groundwater. Okay. Thanks. Those are all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Sure, any other commissioners have questions? Just gonna look quickly. Um, I have a quick question. Sure, Dave Kaplan. Um, so this is about performance of the underground filtration and the two foot separation. Um, could you just provide um, an example or point us to an example where um, you feel that that separation wasn't adequately provided and um, and the basis for that conclusion the the at the bottom of the proposed infiltration basins adjacent to the townhomes is six feet the applicant's highest observed groundwater elevation was four feet so that they've demonstrated two feet of separation the okay. where I 
question anything is the Massachusetts standard is for the seasonal high groundwater level and a measurements of the groundwater elevation were determined in May of last year um, based on on soil redox so it's it's certainly a point in time um, and again making sure that we have always have that two feet of separation or, or regularly have that two feet of separation so that the bottom of the infiltration chambers is not submerged. That's that's the key. I think I have more concerns about the proximity of the infiltration basins to the basements than I do mm -hmm. about their ability to meet standard four. Okay, thank you. Sure, and that's it. I don't see any other hands. So that's a good segue for what I was going to ask. It seemed like there was a lot of, um, there's a good bit of what I was reading about referred back to the fact that the applicant was going to waterproof to prevent infiltra infiltration uh, of groundwater. And I wanted to know, I wanted to know just saying that seems to be great, but I can't, I don't understand what that means to waterproof a basement that you're telling us is in the groundwater so no problems happen in the future. And then what does that do to the surrounding, you know, to the surrounding land? There are a lot of abutters here that are concerned um, that this is going to exasperate flooding that they already experience in this area. So if you could start, if you could help me out with that question, I, I'd appreciate it. I think I would like to let the applicants speak for themselves on their plans for flood proofing. Uh, I, that was not part of any review that, that I completed. The specific, sorry, the specific technologies and approaches, construction methods um, for the flood proofing in the basements wasn't part of the review I completed. So in 2.5 in the standard four, 80% TSS, you, you say the applicant should provide and a review of seasonal high groundwater elevations. And then it goes on from there. But do you, why do you don't feel like you've received uh, the proper evaluation on the seasonal high groundwater? Because there's quite a bit of variation within the site. There is, I would like to compare it to the wetland elevations that were observed adjacent to the site. Infiltration within um, within areas proximal to wetlands is, is usually difficult. It's, it's not um, the, the preferred method most of the time. It can work. Um, and, and really, it's just the tolerances we're dealing with are so tight. We're talking about you know inch inches or a foot of separation on these structures, um, and in some cases we you know it's been acknowledged that the groundwater elevation is above the basements of of the buildings, of the townhomes. Excuse me. And you were saying when they place the uh, infiltration chambers, the FEMA has a uh, note or requirement that it can't be placed on fill because they don't consider that needs to be and what yeah so that particular that particular comment relates to the senior living um facility and i i would would like to re would like to hear from the applicants on that one as i read their grading plans they're using fill to provide separation um between the floodplain and the structure but the the existing topo contours are very light gray and they're kind of hard to read. So uh, I, the, the standard is is not to use fill to provide separation. Okay, Nathaniel Stevens. Yeah, sorry, just to follow up on a uh, answer that, that Ross just gave. Ross, can you tell me, you talked about wetland elevation. Can you just clarify what you mean by that term? I'm not yeah, um, I'm not a wetland scientist, but in general, wetland scientists are will go out and make determinations about normal water levels, mean annual high water levels, uh, which, yeah, as the name implies, um, they use vegetative indicators and soil indicators to determine where water um, gets frequently. 
And so the, the thought there is that those sorts of hydrologic responses of the wetland are probably mirrored in the groundwater. Um, you get localized groundwater, groundwater mounding, excuse me, and, and there's a high relationship between groundwater levels and wetlands that are, that are, sorry, wetlands and the, their, the groundwater levels in their vicinities. Okay, right. It, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate it. I think I understand and agree with that. Your your latter point about sort of the correlation of the groundwater to, you know, it's likely closer to the surface where there's a wetland. Um, right. I'm just wondering if, do the applicant's plans show, do they have, I think there's there's spot elevations where the bordering vegetated wetlands are, if I'm not mistaken on that. I mean, absent. So I was just wondering, so I, I did ask that question um, farther down in this document, and I, I, I did receive an, a separate response. Um, I, I think it, it it indicated that they they didn't follow the terminology I used. Um, I, oh, let me look where it was. Because um, I, yes, I, I called them regulatory, then that's probably, that's not the right nomenclature. Um, it would be the last bullet point of standard four. Um, I, I, I suggested use of a mean annual high water level or an ordinary high water level or some, some other hydrologic indicator um, at, as a validation of the seasonal high groundwater level that they were, they were using of four feet. Okay, understood. I think in... In my experience, the main annual high water is actually referring to a different type of resource area, a riverfront area, which is not present here, versus uh, a BBW. Um, so I, I think I understand what you're what you're getting at, but I, I think perhaps maybe that's why there's some confusion because mean annual high water is usually used in the context of establishing the boundary for a riverfront area rather than a bordering vegetated wetland. But I, I still I, see your point about. It. The, your overall point, I think, is getting at the fact that where there's a wetland, since there's inundation near the surface and just below the surface, it's most likely that that's uh, the groundwater fed and the groundwater is going to be higher in those locations. So even though the, that term might have been a little confusing, I, I, I understand. I think the science backs up your point. I apologize. Different jurisdictions use different terminology for the same thing. Sure. In my own jurisdiction, we call that the ordinary high water level for wetlands. Um, I know other uh, okay. places use different language for it. Sure. Thanks. Okay. So I think we, uh, I don't see any other hands. I see Nathaniel's hands still up, but I'm oh, sure. Sorry. I'll put it down. Sorry about that. Okay. So, uh, Seeing no other hands, the applicant, uh, Dominic, are you here? Yes, I see you. Dominic, um, could you take over from this point and address the questions that you heard, but you'll probably get a few more from the Conservation Commission. Certainly. So, Just to introduce yourself for yeah, the record. For the please. record, Dominic Rinaldi with BSC Group. I uh, was double site engineers, wetlands scientists, and land surveyors and landscape architects for the project. Um, so yes, um, to to answer a lot of the questions, I guess I will summarize again um, what we used for our groundwater elevations. Well, yes, our actual observed groundwater, um, as as uh, your peer reviewer said, did vary, and that does happen uh, throughout the site. What we actually used um, was the redoxomorphic features and the highest elevation, actually tiny bit higher because we just rounded up to a nice whole round number um, found in, in any of the test pits, which as, as they mentioned, uh, we used elevation four. Um, we actually observed them at like just a shade under four. Um, and we set the bottoms of all of these infiltration systems, the large one in the back and the, the smaller ones in the driveways to the townhouses at elevation six to provide that two feet, uh, minimum two feet of separation. Um, Redox features aren't a point in time. Redox features are a permanent feature. They represent the highest elevation that groundwater, when it fluctuates, gets to with regularity enough to, to move uh, minerals and um, other elements of the soil and create that 
color, the, the variations in the color um, that you see there, um, whether it's depletions by by minerals coming out or, or um, concentrations of, of minerals in spots. So that's where we used it, which is the which is the process documented by the stormwater handbook and is the, the standard uh, methodology to do this. Um, we didn't want to use the observed groundwater in other areas because as you said, it, it varied. Um, so we picked the worst case, which again, redox features not a point in time, a permanent um, elevation. And that's what we used for the bottom and how we set all of these elevations. As far as how it sort of corresponds to wetlands, it actually corresponds pretty well. Um, as uh, I believe Nathaniel said, there are um, contours generally down by the, um, the flag wetlands. For the most part, the um, wetland boundary is around elevation six. Um, and what you typically will find and, and what I believe uh, we found and we can, we can detail in some more is um, really particularly at the wetland edge, not a lot of standing water, if any, um, and generally groundwater. We're seeing those same redox features, you know, anywhere from a foot to two feet below the surface, which is, as I said, right in there with elevation four. Dominic, um, is there an, is there another way to determine seasonal high groundwater? Because two point five standard four. Um, reviewer says the applicant should provide and review the seasonal high groundwater elevation as required by the stormwater handbook. Uh, so is there two methods? Is there a confusion on how, is there, so what's going on here? Why do we have two different kind of conclusions here? I mean, you obviously would have to ask your, your peer reviewer for, for how they came to their conclusion, but what the, the handbook requires and, and what you do is you, you dig the test bits, you do look for groundwater and you note it when you see it. And we, as we uh, said, we noted it um, when we observed it. Um, we also had a, a town hired um, peer reviewer witnessing these test pits, test pits with us um, in Whitestone Engineering, um, documented the same. We, we agreed on what we saw, where we saw it, um, what the depths were, um, we agreed where the estimated seasonal high groundwater from the redox features was, um, and that is the practice required by the handbook. If you don't see redox features um, and you don't see groundwater, there are other things to do. Um, in this case where we saw both and we went with the worst case scenario for us in terms of, um, you know, the highest redox we found for universally across the site mm. um that is that is the standard we actually think we're pretty conservative in sure i'm just going to follow that up with um it sounds like you there were two indicators in the in the hole if if that terminology works for you yeah. and maybe seasonal high groundwater so there was water and there was some sort of redox features was the water higher and the redox features when you observe, had that observation? No, the water everywhere, the observed groundwater we saw while we were doing the test pits everywhere was in some cases significantly lower than that. Elevation. Lower, right. Um, and I can actually... So in that, in this, uh, you know, I guess it's an average, but we're talking about one situation. The redox feature was the highest point that indicator of seasonal high groundwater in those test pit holes that you reviewed on this site? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and if you give me a minute, I can find where the um, where the, the observed groundwater in that particular pit we're talking about was. Um, I should probably be glasses for this. Um, so yeah, in test pit five, um, the observed standing water, which is um, was about a foot lower than the redox feature. So we saw redox at 48 inches below grade and depth to standing water at 60 inches. 
Sure. Sorry for the interruption. You can you can continue. <laughs> oh, that's it. Uh, so, uh, oh, so uh, but that yeah, I mean that's the big feature. And as, as far as um, the waterproofing question that came up, um, as you know, building designs aren't finalized. Um, when the building designs are finalized, um, the waterproofing for basements and and the underground parking um, will be included in that. Um, it's not uncommon to build basements uh, below groundwater level. It is not uncommon to build parking garages below groundwater levels. We're not um, breaking new ground here with construction methodologies. Um, we're doing stuff that is done fairly regularly in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, and uh, the, the architecture and structural engineering team will, will be responsible for figuring out how to waterproof those basements to keep water out. Sure, I was, it, it just came up so much. I have it down in this report nine times and you say the appropriate waterproofing to prevent groundwater uh, will be determined, I guess, filter and appropriate groundwater infiltration. So I thought that since it was brought up so much that there's there's gotta be something to it. There has to be some reason why um, having an infiltration chamber so close to a structure would be some sort of uh, trigger for a problem down the road. So I, I didn't really understand why we were so concerned about the proximity to the infiltration chambers and the the foundations. Is that something that you can answer? Uh, no, I mean, again, you'd have to ask your peer reviewer with that. Honestly, um, it's not really something that ever particularly comes up uh, within reviews under the Wellness Protection Act. It, um, it is really a building code issue in terms of waterproofing these buildings because they are close. I mean, there are the, these these units are going to be pretty close to these buildings, and therefore it does prompt in addition to the groundwater potential, even more reason to waterproof these these buildings adequately. I thought Ross talked a little bit about the path of least resistance um, along the excavated foundation. Is that a factor that needs well, to be waterproof. concerned? Uh, it, it would be if you don't waterproof. You know, it's okay. it's if you don't want to the basement, um, you know, it will absolutely take the path of least resistance, but that is why you, you go through that extra step. Sure. I, I don't know if it's, uh, it's okay at this point. It sounds like Dominic, you're finished with your presentation pretty much. You're just waiting for questions. Um, yeah. I mean, generally yeah. speaking, I, I think that's a lot of our response came down to how we did the groundwater. Sure. Uh, so I, I, I'd like to, have the commission have the ability to ask Ross or Dominic a question if that's I'm going to say procedurally okay since we have so many people watching tonight's hearing but if it's okay I think that would speed things up and it would be uh, a little bit easier to kind of get your follow-up question answered so Susan um thank you Chuck um I just had a question I I um again about the basements and waterproofing. And I understand that's not in the wetland jurisdiction, but my concern is water has to go somewhere. So if the basements and or the parking is below the groundwater, then the groundwater has to go somewhere. Is it going to get pushed into the wetland? Is it going to get pushed into our buffer zones? Um, it's got to go somewhere. So that's my concern. Who are you asking to answer that? Whoever, <laughs> whoever can answer that. Maybe Ross, maybe Ross you could answer yeah. it and Dominic could answer it. Thank you. Presu presumably, if the applicant takes all the right steps um, as part of construction and, and adequately waterproofs, you know, th those systems could involve sump pumps that discharge to surface. Um, you know, it could just involve displacement. Um, it, it's tough for me to say exactly where it's going to go with without the specific um, plan in mind. But but I, I would concur with Mr. Rinaldi's comment that that 
that sort of thing is usually figured out um, further into design and can often be a, a contingency item on um, advancement of the project, in my experience. So Ross, if we're uh, discharging with a sump pump onto the surface rather than into the town storm drain, which I don't know if is allowed or not, there certainly would be a difference from where the water goes. Um, there wouldn't, you know, maybe a condition or maybe something the commission needs to think about is where this discharge is happening. I'm not even, I don't even know if that's being proposed, but I would say that there is definitely a difference between those two. Uh, those two locations. So, any other questions from commissioners? If I may, Mr. Chair. Uh, sure. As far as some pumps go, um, at, at this point, we, again, the, the building design isn't finalized. Um, generally speaking, as I've said, we're not breaking ground here in terms of building basements in groundwater. Um, it happens everywhere. I do right. a lot of work in the city of Boston. You cannot build a building in the city of Boston without being in the groundwater, pretty much. Um, and if you waterproof a modern building appropriately, you generally don't need a sump pump. Sure. Sometimes uh, tend to be for older buildings with fieldstone foundations or poorly waterproof foundations and things like that. Right, but I, there's still my question. Water has to go somewhere. So if the water's not getting in the basements, fine. That's great for the people who own that house. But is it getting into our jurisdictional areas? Is it is more water inundating the wetland and the buffer zone and the BBW because it's getting pushed there from these structures that are waterproof. That's still not clear to me. I, I, and and I, I'll be honest, I, I can't answer that question, but I also can answer that that is not, that, that, that is occurring everywhere that, that is built. Um, it is not, um, you know, it is not part of uh, stormwater standards in terms of where groundwater goes. Um, it is not generally part of a, a building code. It is um, a function of, of building buildings in the groundwater. Um, it, it happens, while we happen to be relatively close to a wetland, everywhere you build in the groundwater, you are in theory displacing groundwater. It is going somewhere else. Um, so this is, as I said, it is not new ground we're breaking here. This is not something revolutionary. This is not something that hasn't happened in a lot of places. And for that matter, has happened with just about every home that's along Dorothy Road. Um, those all have, you know, they're, you can tell from, from the way they're built in the driveways, they have foundations that were built in the ground. Um, so this is, it's the same concept, just a different type of building. So you seem to think that, thinking about this, that the water would go from Dorothy down to the wetland. It would be natural to think that. Um, if you're installing sump pumps and pumping them out onto the ground or into the um, you know, riprap areas that you have provided, that seems to me that it would get back into the wetlands. But if you're doing sump pumps into the storm drain, there might be some uh, loss of, of, of water to the wetlands and some sort of alteration. And so when do you determine what you're going to do? I'm not even saying that you need to do it. And I think that's what you're saying too. Like, look, we don't know what's down there. We don't know what we're gonna encounter. When do you determine that? And then what's the response to the Conservation Commission when, where you're gonna pump this water if you have to? When do we determine if we need sump pumps? Yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately, that would be in foundation design. Okay. Of, of the buildings, and that would be something. If if some pumps were proposed, that would be part of the building permit plans. Um, they would be part of the plans that get submitted as the final plans for the comprehensive permit. So is that something the Conservation Commission is going to say? Because when you said it was the building permit, I know that that would be the, the, the conservation process is over and the building permit would, would be something different. When would there be a point where the Conservation Commission knows where this water is being pumped? Um, I, I can't speak for, I, I don't know offhand if you get copies of building permit plans to review. Uh, but again, this is um, 
right? Some pumps and basements and waterproofing basements are a building permit um, and building code question. Uh, and that, that's when that design is done. Um, if, do you get, I honestly don't know, do you get a chance for new building permits? So we, uh, so, you know, you have an order of conditions and, and all the conditions are in there. So you'd have to review the building permit and the building plans to make sure that it matches what we approved. But getting back to the sump pump, sump pump in someone's house that's coming, you know, that's going on every time it rains or occasionally is different than putting a foundation three feet into water and then just continually pumping it. And that's why I'm wondering, and you have, yay, so many houses, where is that water going? I think that's appropriate for the Conservation Commission to ask. I'd like you to answer that question um, you know, before we close this hearing. It doesn't have to be tonight, but if you could get a little closer to what do you think may happen uh, and where do you think that water may go? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we can uh, we'll talk to the architects on the buildings, but again, that's it's, um, you know, where it goes, you're making this presumption that we're putting in sump pumps. Um, the exactly. first time sump pumps have ever been mm -hmm. re referenced was in your peer reviewer's letter. Um, at no point in time has this project ever stated that we were going to be putting in sump pumps. Um, I can't say definitively that we're not because that foundations haven't been designed. Yeah. And uh, so. Understood. Uh, any other commission members have a question? I want to give Ryan an opportunity to ask uh, to speak. If you have some, uh, yeah, actually, that, sorry, Chuck. If I can just jump in, I was going to ask Ryan. We didn't get because of a technology issue. We didn't get a BSC's response to Ross's letter until I think yesterday. Um, so I didn't have a chance to look at it thoroughly. But I was just, and I not to put Ryan on the spot, but did he did he check to see? if they provided all the information that Ross said was missing, I guess that would be my overall question. It looked, when I skimmed the BFC letter, it looked like they were responding and saying that they were providing additional information, but I didn't get, have a chance to get into the weeds on it to make to verify. So if, if, Ryan, if you had a chance to do that, it would be helpful to hear, or if you didn't, please let us know that you didn't have the chance. Uh, yeah, so I've, I've kind of briefly looked over it. I haven't given it a, <clears throat> excuse me, the most uh, the most thorough review so far, uh, but it does look like there are a couple more items that are uh, still going to be provided. Uh, there's a lot of okay. references uh, throughout. Uh, I'm just trying to see if they're looking for anything specific that's being called out. Um, Okay, thanks. Yeah, not to elaborate. That's that's sort of the, just the general overall comment that I was looking for. So that's helpful. Thanks. All right. Any but, other sorry, questions? Sorry, I don't know. That was my question to to uh, Ryan. I didn't know Chuck if you were expecting or wanting him to say mm -hmm. anything more. Ryan, do you have anything else to say? Oh, that hasn't really been covered so far. So. Sure. So at this point, it sounds like uh, the commission's had their questions and I want to bring uh, open it up to the public and but I'm going to call on Scott Horsley first right there. Scott, please introduce yourself uh, for the record. Uh, I will certainly do that. Um, I actually have a slide to do that. Do I have permission to share screen, Mr. Chairman? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, please, uh, Ryan, can you set that up? I think I think it might be working. Yep, we see that. Does that look like that's in presentation mode? I can't tell. Maybe no. not. Hold on one second here. <laughs> Looks like it's just off the screen for some reason. It's odd. There we go. Yeah, there you go. There. Is that better? That's great. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, again, I am. I've been retained by the. Uh, Arlington Land Trust to review the project. I've been focused on uh, hydrology impacts, much of what you've already started talking about tonight. Um, briefly, in the way of introductions, um, I have more than 30 years experience, as the slide indicates. Most of my work has been nationally for EPA, done a lot of work for the Nature Conservancy, Mass DEP, other state governments. I've worked actually worked in all 50 states. 
as, as a result of my work for EPA, uh, many municipalities, most of them in Massachusetts, nonprofits and, and industry. Uh, I also served and been qualified as an expert witness many times in court, um, most notably for U.S. Department of Justice in a Clean Water Act uh, federal case, but a number of state cases as well. Uh, I've served on many uh, Mass DEP storm uh, advisory committees. I've, I've highlighted a few here. I'm still currently serving on uh, the Title V advisory committee. And then finally, I do teach. I'm an adjunct faculty member at both Tufts and Harvard, where I teach graduate level courses in, in water management. So I'm going to go through these slides and um, I think be able to address some questions that have come up earlier. Uh, this is a copy of the site plan and I've highlighted some things and I've put in uh, I th what I think are the correct uh, proposed uh, uh, water estimated seasonal high water levels uh, in blue. And I believe the, 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 the test pit that was being referred to earlier tonight is over here at test pit five, the applicants indicating a estimated seasonal high groundwater level of four there. Uh, I will quickly add, add that the primary infiltration facility is highlighted here in gray. So that test pit is not located um, within or even near the uh, large infiltration system. Uh, one of the one of the guidances within the Mass DEP stormwater standards is test pits are required within the footprint of the uh, infiltration facility. Now they do have some test pits here, but as you already heard tonight, they're relying on another test pit uh, to determine um, high groundwater in, at the location of, I think this, and I think I heard all the facilities. So, um, but again, uh, I will start by indicating as I did in my letter, if you look at these numbers, they're very um, highly variable. Uh, and, and in my experience, uh, that is not typical, um, especially in a, in a sort of geology or setting like this, I would expect to see a more uniform uh, set of water levels. These test pits are actually fairly close together. I mean, I would just, here we've got a test pit two at, at 0 0.8 feet, and I, I believe these are all mean, relative to mean sea level, 3.5 feet here. That's a pretty substantial difference. Something, uh, when I first saw these, I was scratching my head. I double-checked all the numbers. Um, I believe these are correct. Um, and again, they do not look um, typical to me and, and strike me that something is going on here. And we'll get to that. I have some theories. I will, this slide also highlights down at the bottom, this is the wetland, one of the wetland boundaries. And, and as the uh, applicant um, indicated, I agree, Dominique said that wetland, ele wetland elevation is around six feet. This shows five or six feet. Now, again, that, that federal case that I mentioned that I did for EPA was all about um, Clean Water Act enforcement of a wetland filling. And, uh, Wetlands are defined under the Clean Water Act as either having inundation or saturation on the hydrology side. Uh, inundation is standing water. Hyd uh, saturation is within 12 inches of the surface during the growing season. So I would suggest these numbers we're seeing here as surface levels would suggest the groundwater along that wetland area would be in the range of four to five feet. Four to five feet. Uh, and as I get to, uh, I would expect that the upland areas of the site the proposed would be higher than that. And that would be a typical, in my experience, hydrologic setting. And I'm going to use this figure from uh, my favorite reference source I use all the time, and that's the U.S. Geological Survey. This is a uh, graphic that shows the typical relationship. Most wetlands in Massachusetts are discharge areas, meaning groundwater is flowing into them. Uh, you can see the middle of the uh, slide, that's the wetland. We have a stream in the middle. And what we see on, on the sides, the areas draining to the wetland, uh, it's denoted here by a water table. The water table, uh, just in case there, just somebody's on the same page, water table is the upper level of the groundwater system. That would be an indication of the so-called seasonal high groundwater. So in other words, we'd expect that to be higher than the areas in the wetland. So this is the same slide I showed you a minute, but I want to spend a minute talking about test pit seven because test pit seven is within the footprint of the large infiltration system. It has a very interesting number of minus uh, 0.5 feet, which frankly, I don't think, I, I, I'm not sure I can say this. I don't think I've ever seen this in a ground level in Massachusetts. I might be wrong, but it would be extremely rare to have the groundwater below sea level. So again, something, 
something is going on here. It doesn't strike me that that's a logical number. I think what the applicant's suggesting is let's use test pick five, the 4.0 number. However, if, if we go to the, um, the Whitestone report, this is the report that was mentioned earlier by the applicant that was done, I believe, for the town. And I've just, I've just uh, screenshot part of that report for test pit seven. And you can see on the left, I've highlighted the numbers I wanted to uh, focus on. Um, test pit on the left side uh, looks, looks like um, the interpretation of this report was to use 108 inches depth, which would put the estimated seasonal high water table at essentially zero, which is real close to the minus 0.5 number I just showed you. The land elevation, from what I can tell from the site plans, is around nine feet. 108 inches is nine feet. So that gives you a calculated um, estimated seasonal high water of zero or, or minus 0.5, which I believe is the number that the is stated on the plan. However, if you look over on the right here, there was a note in the um, Whitestone report at test pit seven that they found some mottling, 39 inches. So if you run the numbers using the mottling, Nine minus three point two, you get you get an estimated seasonal high water of five point eight. Let's call it six feet to round it off, and let's go back to this picture. So maybe maybe this is six feet here. Now again, just looking at this in the context of the wetlands, uh, wetlands are down here. This is where I expect groundwater at four to five feet, and as you move upland this direction, um, I expect water table to get higher. Uh, there, there's not enough data to draw water table contours, but it's certainly possible that the groundwater in this area would be higher than over at test pit five. So, but if you did use the modeling numbers, this puts you around 5.7, 5.8 feet at this location. So um, that, that I think is worth considering as another way to interpret that test pit. Um, and, and in my mind, that makes a lot more sense to me, just in terms of what would be expected for a groundwater level, again, relative to the wetland, but also relative to test pit five. Uh, and, and, and by the way, the test pit five is the place where they found the mottling. Uh, test pit seven, again, they did. if we use the mottling at test pit seven, we get 5.7 feet. Now, back to you, you asked some very good questions earlier, and so I wanna, I wanna address them as well. And one question that was asked earlier is, aren't there different methods to determine seasonal high groundwater? And I might digress for a second and say, especially for this site, I think this is a critical number. I'm glad we're spending time on it tonight um, because the whole site design is, uh, drives uh, a lot of things, a lot of the, not only the foundations, but certainly the stormwater infiltration structures. So this is a quote directly from the Mass DEP Stormwater Handbook. And I might add, I did serve on the Mass DEP Stormwater Advisory Committee and frankly was quite involved in drafting uh, the standard number three, which deals with the groundwater recharge uh, number or, or, or um, standard that we're talking about tonight. So you can see here that as it's, I have highlighted and I've uh, bolded some areas, um, it basically it says where redox features are not available, um, installation of wells. Isometers is another term for wells and measurements through the spring. Uh, they also suggest comparing the water levels that are measured with uh, so-called USGS index wells. And there's a, there's, a, there's a hyperlink here. You can go to the uh, USGS site. Uh, USGS maintains, uh, I'm going to guess, around 20 index wells around the state. Uh, some are monitored every 15 minutes. Other, others are monitored weekly. Um, and this has been going on for decades. And these wells are used for both um, Title V wastewater compliance, but also stormwater compliance, because we have a long-term track record and we can compare um, shorter term measurements um, on sites with the long-term record to see if in fact the water levels might go higher. Uh, this is, this is um, one of the index wells, the USGS index wells. This is the Lexington well, which I believe is one of the closer wells to the site. Uh, and the general guidance from USGS is to use uh, a well that's in relatively close proximity. The Whitestone uh, testing was done May 18th, 19th, 2023. Uh, this well, the, the uh, Lexington well, is one that does not have uh, continuous recorder on it, but for rather they, they monitor it roughly once a week. So what I've done is I've highlighted these two black dots, 
which which kind of frame or bracket, if you will, um, the time when Whitestone was out there doing the measurements. See, and over on the left here, these are depths to groundwater. So the estimated seasonal high groundwater, when you use the USGS databases, is you're looking for the highest ones, which is really back here. Uh, so this point here is about two feet higher than the time of measurements are during the Whitestone study. Okay, so just that, that would be um, that would be one thing that could be used, and as I get to my recommendations later, uh, to help really verify the water levels. I, I mean, I think given this site and the discussion you've already had, uh, my recommendation would be to use any and all methods, uh, both modeling and um, the USGS monitoring well methods. And I might add just to digress, I have a site I'm working on the town of Easton right now, where we are routinely measuring groundwater levels above the mottling in the soils. And I can we can talk more about that later. So that is certainly possible. It's unusual. Uh, that site is also a site where it's been disrupted. Some fill has been placed, um, which I think can change uh, hydrology long-term and perhaps even change water level relative to redox. But again, that's another story. We can come back to that later. I think the USGS method is something to consider here. Um, the other part of the presentation I'd like to make deals with groundwater mounding. And I made some comments on this, and I did see in um, the peer reviewer's letter, they didn't mention it tonight, but they, I believe they also recommended some additional groundwater mounding analysis. So I think we're consistent on that recommendation. Um, but let me just quickly go through it. First of all, what is groundwater mounding? This is again, a US geological survey slide. Basically when you're infiltrating runoff, which is shown in the middle here, upper, and that water infiltrates down through the soils and eventually hits the water table, the groundwater system, you get actually a physical mound on top of the water table. Uh, this says this is temporary. Uh, generally this lasts for a few days around the time of a so-called 24 hour design storm. Uh, these mounds can also last a lot longer if in fact infiltration rates are sustained higher than existing conditions. And I'll get to that in a minute, but in any case, this is a sort of an introductory graphic of what we're talking about with groundwater mounding. We're adding water levels to the existing groundwater system. And I pulled these, this is an excerpt from the um, stormwater report that was provided by the applicant. Now, as, as part of standard three, uh, in the Mass DEP system, understands one of the requirements, there's actually two parts to that uh, standard. One is, one talks about matching pre-development hydrology, put the same amount of recharge in the ground as exists. But then it goes on to say, you can also add more groundwater if you want. Uh, however, if you do that, then you have to evaluate the consequences of, of increasing it. So what I've done here is highlighted and in large blue letters made a little bit easier to read uh, the so-called required recharge volume, which the applicant calculates, that, that represents existing conditions. And that number is 1638 cubic feet. Now, what they do is they have to, they just have to design the system to, to match that and, and possibly exceed it somewhat, as long as they can evaluate the exceeding part. Well, they have exceeded here by quite a bit, Mr. Chairman. The uh, proposed amount is 10,497. So this is a factor of more than six, um, not doubling the amount of recharge, not tripling it, but times six. So that suggests to me that we're likely to have not only some groundwater mounding around specific design events, but groundwater mounding or higher water levels throughout the year, simply because we are increasing the, effectively increasing the recharge rate of the site. And I do have a couple of slides to explain this because I've said, pitched this before and tried to get, explain this. Sometimes this is a hard uh, concept to understand. So let me just quickly go through it. Uh, this is a slide showing a typical site and a natural recharge rate of 17 inches per year. Now again, we get around 40 some odd inches of rain, about 40% of it in Massachusetts is returned to the atmosphere as evapotranspiration. You can see these trees on the slide. They're removing about almost half of the rainfall and the remaining amount, a lot of it, if it's permeable soil, will infiltrate and recharge the groundwater. This site, I would estimate around 17 and a half inches per year of recharge. And again, with the trees currently in place, 
a lot of that water is going back to the atmosphere as evapotranspiration. Uh, when we when we construct a site, and, and these little rectangles will denote a infiltration system coming from both roof runoff and also pavement areas. What happens is the existing estimated seasonal high groundwater condition, which is shown on the dash line, actually increases uh, post development conditions. And again, this is something that's going to occur year round. The, the the whole fluctuation of the water table will be higher because we are adding a lot more to the groundwater system throughout the year. Every time it rains, water is going in there, a lot more water. In fact, according to the applicant's uh, calculations, about six times as much in terms of the volume that they're designing. So this is a pretty significant impact. On top of that, when we get a design event, like a 10-year, 25, 100-year storm event, there's, a, there's this bubble, again, the groundwater mount I showed you earlier, which would frankly be on top of the post-development conditions. So there's really, if we do this right, if we do the modeling right, which we'll get to in a few minutes, there's really two steps. One is, what's the effect of the year-round increase in recharge? And then secondly, what happens when we get a big storm? Which And the big storm evaluation is required by Mass DEP Stormwater Handbook. Um, so that, that takes me to what has been done and what I've done. On a, and I will add, my work has been on a preliminary basis. I'm not sure if the applicant is indicating this is preliminary or final. I'll leave that up to them to determine. But this is the applicant's groundwater mounting. This is from their report. Uh, what they're showing is, uh, and I'll just quickly explain, these are the input parameters that go into this model. And this is the simple hand twitch model, which is an analytical model. There are more detailed models that I'll get to in a few minutes that I think might be more appropriate for this site, given the complexity. But in any case, this is an acceptable, I call it a screening model, first cut. Um, but I start here, um, they've used a time of 0 0.4 days. Uh, that's like, um, what is it, about an hour or two. This is a 24, this is a storm event that lasts 24 hours. So I, I have not been able to determine, I did, I did try to reach out to the applicant quite a while ago to see if I could simply ask that question and was not unable to speak with them because I just, it is a question. I don't know why we're we using such a tiny time frame. Obviously, you run it out to the 24-hour storm. All of these design events, the 10-year storm, the 25 and the 100-year, are 24-hour events. They, they rains, you get runoff for close to the 24 hours, you're going to have infiltration for close to 24 hours. This model run is for 0 0.046 days. So that, I'll just leave that as a question. I just simply do not understand it. So I ran a couple of models using the same model. And by the way, I did use all the other input parameters. This is uh, the recharge rate, how much water is going in. This is the specific yield, the hydraulic conductivity, the dimensions of the infiltration system, 98 by 20. Uh, and so I've, I've maintained those all the same. I didn't change any of those. But what I did do is change the time uh, in, this, in, this, in this model to, to two days because you're going to get the design storm. And then what I did is I looked at the volume of water coming into the infiltration facility and the infiltration rate or exfiltration rate from the facility provided by the applicants can take about two days to drain. And I'm getting uh, closer to 14 feet of uh, groundwater mounding. Now that is not physically possible. That becomes what we call a potentiometric surface or a pressure surface. What that means is, and again, you asked a great question before, where does the water go? I forget who said it, but it can't go into the air. So it's got to go someplace else. And probably in this case, we go as an overflow. But in any case, um, I think it's obvious that you get a much higher groundwater mound um, with a longer time duration than the, than the one used earlier. And I used one other, I did one other um, um, analysis here. I looked at the year round. You see, I've got 365 days here. Uh, year round of, uh, mounding before you get to the design storm. And again, it looks like we're getting several feet of groundwater mounding. Uh, prior to the design storm. So these are, um, again, I'm, I'll repeat, these are not final analyses by me. I don't know if the applicants is final, but we're, we're, there's quite a range here. And I, I think for me, my conclusion is um, a little more tension might be really helpful here. And that gets me to my last slide and my recommendations. Um, first of all, I really think it's important that we get some monitoring wells uh, wells are a better method, in my opinion, to get groundwater levels than test pits. As the applicant said, and I think the peer reviewer said it, 
test pit's a one-shot deal. You look at it, you open up the test pit, you look at what you see, and you close it back up. You can try to determine some longer-term conditions from the modeling, but again, as I said, um, there's different ways to interpret that. But in any case, the best way, I think, I think we'd agree, would be monitoring wells. And there's very uh, affordable, easy to use uh, devices now called pressure transducers. This is the second recommendation. You install in those wells. They take a measurement every 15 minutes, um, and uh, you know, you get this on your you get this on your smartphone. This is pretty standard stuff nowadays. And therefore, we can monitor the groundwater levels through the spring months. The good news is we're approaching a good time of year to do these measurements, um, and so if we can get the wells in there. And do that, I think we'd all have some better data to work with within the, within the footprints of these infiltration systems. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, I think I would strongly recommend that the commission uh, ask or require the applicant to do a groundwater model that's a little bit more sophisticated than what's already been provided. Uh, there is, uh, I didn't note it here, but I think I did in my letter, the, the industry standard is a model called Mod Flow. It is a it was developed by the U.S. Geological Survey. It, it shows up in I'll just say ninety percent of the studies that are out there from regulatory standpoints. A very common model. I'm sure the applicant's familiar with it. Um, that would enable a much better, reliable way to determine what happens post development. And I think it would answer both questions about will these Infiltration systems work. Will they get inundated? You can also the model can also show effects on foundations, and then perhaps most importantly to the commission member who asked the question, "What about the wetland?" Uh, one of the other requirements in the Mass DP stormwater stormwater handbook is exactly that: what does the groundwater model show at the wetland boundary? So this model can show that and answer that question. Um, so those are my three recommendations, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you or the commission members might have. Thank you. Sure. Can you uh, stop screen sharing? And we'll get back to the full screen. And any commissioners? Um, Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Scott, for that uh, presentation. I was just going to ask uh, could, if, if you haven't sent this, your slides already to Brian at the commission, that would be helpful. So I, did, I, did do, I did do that earlier, uh, Nate and um, Daniel, and I did um, I did add a couple of slides tonight, which I can pass along as well. But I did already. Okay, see. thanks. Yeah, that'd be helpful because you present a lot of information. But like, nice to look at that again. I'm just going to a couple specific points you made. Um, okay. If I understood your uh, your comment about test pit, test pit seven, which is where the infiltration, which is one of the two test pits that's located where the infiltration basin is located, you're saying that the groundwater is not at negative five as the applicant presents it, but you calculate it to be 5.7 feet. Is that right? Based upon the test pit that I showed you from White Whitestone, they did indicate some modeling. And if I okay. use that number, it comes to around 5.7, 5.8. Okay, thanks. And just remind me, so what's, does that mean that there's uh, sufficient, is there, does that mean there's not sufficient separation between the uh, groundwater and the bottom of the infiltration um, uh, basin, infiltration device, which is required by the, sand, as required by the sand, where, yeah, excuse me, it's like stormwater mm -hmm. handbook. <laughs> yeah, as, as the applicant said earlier, there is a minimum two foot separation required between the bottom of the facility and the water table. And then that anything less than a four foot separation also triggers the groundwater mounting analysis to make sure it doesn't inundate the system or cause other problems. Okay. So in this so case, we, we use we, the five point. Sorry. Sorry, so, so just to so conclude on that point, the five points, if the 5.7 number is used, then it does not comply with the stormwater handbook. Is that correct? If you use that number, that's correct. Yes. Okay, thanks. Currently designed. That's currently fine. Thanks. And then another point you're making, uh, you had the slide up that quoted the language from volume three, page 12 of the stormwater handbook. And it was talk, it said, I think I'm trying to summarize, it said um, that you may use 
uh, read them lots of features and it used the word may so it didn't require and then it goes on to say if those features are not available you know use do one or two or three other things so to me i guess what what is <laughs> what is required because they, they both seem both you know there's a may in that first sentence and then the second sentence said well if those features aren't available but at the site they are available so are we required to then use the, the uh, right so it's features? yeah so i it, their um redoxymorphic features are commonly used uh, as the as the estimated seasonal high groundwater in this particular test pit seven they were discounted they were shown but they weren't used um but they could be it could be used uh, however, as I said, um, to my surprise, and I'd love to show people this, it's quite interesting, uh, you can get groundwater levels above redox levels. They can go higher. So therefore, in my view, my experience, because and I can take any of you to the site to show you this, this is not numbers, this is like I can show you in the field that this happens. Um, therefore, the best thing, in my opinion, is to use both of those methods. If you have redox, go ahead and also put in wells and get the water levels and compare them and then and use the index wells. These are tools that we have. I don't know why we wouldn't use them, especially on a site like this, where, again, I think we'd all agree this groundwater is a valid issue to be evaluated. So why not use the best tools we have? Uh, none of them are, none of them are perfect, but um, I think if we use them in conjunction with each other, uh, and I think that, I think that's what that, um, text that I showed you suggest, in my opinion. That's what the, that'll be my interpretation of it. Okay, thank you. Um, and then just one, uh, two more questions. You talked about the, the USGS site called Lexington 104. Uh, can you tell, I and mean, you're saying that that's the closest one to the site. Do you have any idea about, you know, where that is? And are, and then the second part of that question is, um, is it the same sort of site conditions that were that are at this site? Is it the same geology, yeah, same soils, and things like that? So I, I I have you know U.S. Geological Survey does provide a map showing the well locations, so I can surely provide that. Um, to, and I, again, this is something that um, that's one index well. There may be another one nearby. Typically, if I try to look at a couple of these, I just show that one as an example. The okay. reason I did it is I wanted to see. Somebody mentioned to me when I was looking at the data, when when um, when Whitestone was doing the work, was it a wet spring? I, and I couldn't remember, so I wanted to look back and see. And it looks like it was about uh, one or two feet lower than the, the seasonal highs uh, at that time. And that's that's why I was looking at it. And the Lexington well is relatively close by. There's not that many of them. I think there's around 15 or 20 index wells across the state. Hmm. So I don't think there's, if there is one other, it's probably equal distance, and but it's it's probably a reasonable one to consider. Certainly, though, I'm more hap more than happy to look at more index wells. In fact, I'll probably do that because uh, I think we should, as we move forward here, more data is better, right? Um, and I forget the second part of your question. I'm sorry. Uh, thanks, Joey. I, uh, I guess it was well related to that. Yes, I think it was. Is that site sort of representative? If we're going to use data, oh. I think it's right. We want to pull from similar. Sort of, geological sites and not be yeah ideal ideally you want to do that but frankly the sites are never exactly the same i think no. the point of doing this is to, as i was saying to see whether when you're out there at, at a particular time if in fact it's a wet period or not so it just gives you a, a general idea and okay. I'm, I'm not suggesting this site is is identical hydrogeologically to the lexington site it's an indicator and it's just mm -hmm the tools that's all okay thanks and then uh my last question if i may chuck um scott you recommended uh, a more sophisticated type of groundwater uh, groundwater sorry groundwater modeling <laughs> methodology towards the end of your presentation i was wondering is there a basis what basis in the stormwater handbook could we cite uh, to require the applicant to do that if, if the commission decides yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. and i think i think it's in my letter if it is no i'm so, sorry that i'm forgetting I believe, that sorry okay excuse me i believe i mentioned the usgs mod flow method and it is it is referenced in the mass dp stormwater handbook um it, the, the both methods the hand tush analytical model 
and the USGS mod flow model are both referenced. Um, generally, it's a sort of, uh, you know, the analyst call which one is most appropriate. Uh, the, the USGS model is much more sophisticated, allows a lot more detailed. The Hanswish model makes a number of very simplifying assumptions. I think in this case where you've got multiple infiltration facilities, you've got a number of, quote, sensitive receptors, both foundations and infiltration system and the wetlands, uh, I think Hanswish is, is again, a reasonable screening tool. But I think, the, I think in this case, and I do have experience on other wetland appeals um, that have gone to the EP, uh, and they've required, they've agreed to require the mod flow analysis for more complex sites. Okay. Thanks very much. I do look forward to um, hearing from BSC, uh, their response response to maybe, you know, the, their response to the questions I asked or Scott's response to my questions as well as overall presentation. Um, I guess it's up to Chuck to decide when that, when that might be. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so Dominic's hand up, but uh, I, I think I'll take this opportunity to get Dave Kaplan uh, to ask his question. Yeah, I'm um, just trying to get some, you know, what's, the groundwater elevations that you showed, um, you know, with test pit seven at negative five or point five, excuse me, test pit eight at two point two, and then test pit five, I guess, is the most conservative in that area of, of groundwater elevation of four. Um, I mean, that that to me suggests that this could be a uh, a discharging wetland system. And do, do I mean I, I'm wondering if anybody we have enough information that we can comment on sort of groundwater flow direction or do we know anything else about the this area that could kind of help us figure out what's going on and what account what's accounting for this variability um, that we're seeing. So it's a pretty broad question, um, and I, I would put that out either to the uh, consultants to. Um, uh, the applicants or to, to Mr. Horsley. David, was that a question for me or gen generally? I don't. I, I missed a couple of things that you said. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I apologize. I guess so. I, I'm just looking at the variability of the groundwater elevations that you showed in your figure um, marked in blue, um, and also. It, to me, observing that, it looks like that this system could be a discharge wetland system and that the groundwater flow direction is actually moving away from the wetland system, at least at the time that these observations were made. Um, and, but can, is there anything else that, you know, can we shed some light and account for some of this variability that we're seeing in this area? It seems like redoxymorphic features were used in all these test pits rather than groundwater elevation. And that's sort of a typical variability that you would see um, in this small area, or is this atypical? Well, I, I'll, if, if part of it's directed towards me, I think, as I said before, this is not something that I typically see this much variability over that much area. Uh, it, it's, it's not uncommon to get one or two points that are, you know, the, uh, inconsistent and there you know there's something funny going on there but this one's this one's quite um variable more variable and, and again my experience others may have a different experience but um it's quite variable and um but my understanding is there is some fill here too the site's been disrupted somewhat and that can certainly cause some of these, as i mentioned the site i'm working on in easton the measured water levels are higher than the redox levels and we've it's been pretty interesting. We've been out to the site several times. I was scratching their heads, and and I think we have some theories as to why that is, and it has to do with the disrupted site. So that might and your theory, your question about the wetland functioning differently. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities. This is why I think we need more information to uh, understand it better. Um, and in my experience, and maybe. Dominique and Russ, Ross have different experiences. Most wetlands in Massachusetts are discharge areas. Groundwater is flowing towards them. It's rare in my experience to have it the other way around. Is it possible? Sure. Uh, that, that would be a unique condition that would require some, you know, documentation, in my opinion. And, and I also kind of want to game this out a little bit in terms of, you have test pit five at 
uh, groundwater elevation for, which is, you know, seems to be the most conservative in that area, and it's consistent with the wetland elevation at a six and at a five. Um, so I assume that even if that test pit seven and test pit eight were more consistent with the four that's observed in that area, that we're still, we still have that two foot separation. And that, that could be a question for Dominic. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, would you like me to chime in? Yeah, yeah, let's okay. just, just okay. game it on and say test pit eight, test pit seven, according to Scott Horsley, you know, uh, Figures are now are, are now groundwater for elevations. We still yes. Yeah, so, if I can clarify a couple of things on there. So, um, as you noticed from uh, Mr. Horsley's uh, slideshow, the the documentation from Whitestone, and just to clarify, um, the test pits were actually performed by the applicant with Whitestone observing mm -hmm. on behalf of the town, which was a requirement to, come to permit. Um, You'll notice they just reference modeling. And just to clarify again for everybody else, modeling and redox interchangeable terms. Um, when people call re redoxomorphic features or redox features and modeling, it's the same thing. Um, so you notice the modeling was just through a certain portion of the test pit wall. And when you use this process, which is actually derived from Title V for septic systems, the estimated seasonal high groundwater to determine that with redox, those redox features that modeling has to go all the way through down into the test pit. If it's just a little portion of the wall, it is not indicative of an estimated seasonal high groundwater, which is why Whitestone also agreed with the elevation and the depth that, that we used. Um, for what it's worth, if there's a little variation in our elevations and Whitestone's elevations, um, he was probably pulling them off the plans. We actually sent a survey crew out to shoot location. We staked all our test pit locations. So there might be a little variation in there because obviously, you know, interpolating between contours is, you know, as good as you can get. Um, yeah, as for some of the the, the other questions, again, um, as, as you were saying, David, we, we utilized the, the most conservative value. A lot of these test pits was observed groundwater. In my my in my experience, and, and I think Ross agreed with this earlier, Ross Mullen, you do see variation on sites. It, it can be weird. It seems weird, but it does happen. Um, I've had sites with wild variation and I couldn't tell you why with observed groundwater. And that is actually really why in the handbook, they push you towards using redox features because that is not a point in time measurement. As I said earlier, that is a permanent feature. Um, you know, some of the other items um, for reference, the only groundwater mounding analysis referenced in the handbook, and I have it up on my screen right now, is the Hantush method. That is the standard. Um, that is why we use it. That is why everybody uses it when they do groundwater mounding for uh, under the Wellness Protection Act. Um, so th again, that is, that, that's the process to readily available, um, well understood model. Um, is it more simplified than others? Yes, but that is the standard. That is what DEP has, has stated they want you to use and, and driven you to use as well as redox. So, um, a lot of the other things Mr. Horsley brought up, um, again, these aren't requirements of the Lots Protection Act. They're, um, you know, they're branching out into other areas that um, DEP and the stormwater standards just don't require. Um, and I, I, just one more quick question. Thank, thank you for entertaining these. Um, the, the large recharge chamber underneath test pit eight, test pit seven, that's primarily, is that only serving um, the roof runoff and there's no water quality that's being um uh yeah i guess you know I'm, I'm thinking of you know if there is temporary mounding that's uh, causing surcharging say we get the heavy rain in the spring maybe the groundwater elevations up uh, if that does the fails to recharge you know you're it looks like you're allowing for 
you know, six times more recharge than is required. So let's say you do have a storm at the park that allows that to surcharge a little bit. Um, is there a water quality component that's not going to be addressed because of that? Or is this just going to be a recharge requirement that's not going to be met if that happens? No. So the recharge to answer the first part of your question that the big system um, takes roof runoff and site runoff. There's um, the, some of the driveway and that um, sort of there's a, a couple of parking surface parking spaces, the little drop off rotary. Um, I shouldn't call it rotary, the little drop off tree circle. Um, all do discharge to the infiltration system. Um, a, <laughs> Water units going before, you know, the, what's serving the site. I see a water quality unit. Yes, down. yeah. So there's there's water, but there's deep for for the site portion of it. There's deep sump putting catch basins and water quality units to provide treatment. Um, in addition, the the treatment measurements are based off that first flush. Um, and this is crazy that I can't remember if this site is a half inch or an inch. Um, it was done accordingly. Um, and so it's that the treatment that you're getting from the infiltration systems is really from that first flush. And as you said, we are providing an extensive uh, amount of recharge. So everything that is below the outlet from that system by nature eventually has to recharge. Um, so it's only those the later elements of the storm that you know that aren't picking up sediments and pollutants because they've already been surface. But you would you would be meeting your eighty percent TSS regardless. Well, we meet, yeah. Of the yes. at, yeah. the, at that time or not? Okay, thank yeah. you. So that, that's those are all my questions. I appreciate. It. Okay, uh, right now I don't see any other hands up from the commission, and I think we've. Um, gone a long time with this. I see that someone on a phone has had their hand up for a long time. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to get give that person uh, time to introduce themselves and uh, ask their question, but then after that, ask for a motion to continue to our next hearing. Um, we're not closing tonight, so anyone else that's participating as an abutter We'll have an opportunity at the next meeting to ask their questions, but uh, we have many other things on our agenda. So 781 at the ending 644, can you unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask your, ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I, um, I have to say that I was fascinated by uh, the Arlington Land Trust uh, representative there in the data. That was uh, very interesting and in following the questions and such. Um, I'm glad to see that a, a very, very bright light is being placed on uh, water management by the Conservation Commission because throughout the many iterations and years of this project now, that has always been probably the foremost concern in all of the abutters' minds, uh, as well as density and other things, but stormwater and, and uh, water table in general has been a, a very big deal. Um, I guess my first question just, just quickly is, has any of the design of uh, this current uh, project changed since the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, approved the 40B application? So design is really not the purview of the Conservation Commission. Um, so okay. I'm not, I'm not sure we can answer that question for you. So I'm just going to let All it right. stand. Yeah. Okay. What, what aspect? Uh, no, I, well, the only reason I'm bringing it up is, uh, in terms of how the building will deal with the various water tables that we've just heard about are projected for this site. I didn't know if there'd been any additional design. So maybe maybe that's a, a discussion point, really not not for your group. Um, and I was uh, very interested to hear the um, the varying of the water um, water levels in the test pits. It sounds to me like the recommendation of, of the gentleman who spoke to um, supporting the Arlington Land Trust uh, activity was um, smart in that 
So more information here would matter because, as I said, this has been the issue for the long-term nature ever since this project and all of its iterations has happened. And to move away from all the scientific data to just uh, all the anecdotal data that came up in the earlier hearings, the, um, as you know, all the abutters have, have flooding basement problems, and uh, this is a constant issue. So I'm hoping that when the Conservation Commission makes an eventual recommendation, hopefully with some additional scientific data from more studying of test pit or more well driving or whatever it was I was, I was hearing from the uh, consultant, um, that they potentially put a condition or stipulation that a belts and suspenders water mitigation plan will be demanded of this of this project. And I don't know if that is within the purview of the Conservation Commission, but clearly belt and suspenders is needed here in, in my humble opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh you're welcome. Uh, yeah, I think we're uh, we're on the on the road to trying to understand this ourselves. So turning back to the commission, we had a few comments tonight about um, from our third party reviewer. We uh, for an additional mounding analysis and some collection of additional groundwater information. Those are in uh, 2.3 for the mounding and 2.4. Would would be about pit, uh, test pit seven. That's collection additional information. I was I asked a question about um, sump pumps, and I don't I'm not going to go through that again. And Scott Horsley, uh, representing the Arlington Land Trust, brought up uh, a lot of stuff. But uh, he one of the things that he asked for was this uh, USGS mod flow groundwater model. I don't know if the commission wants to talk about any of those tonight or if uh, we'll just get a motion to continue. And uh, my, I guess my last thought about this is I'm not sure that we uh, in our review uh, and if um, so, when we put out our uh, contract with um, Hatch, whether Ross Mellon will be coming to our next meeting or not, or it's only one meeting that we had uh, Ross at. Maybe that's Duke, do you know? Or does uh, Ryan, do you know, reviewing our... I'm sorry, Chairman, I was muted. Um, absolutely, if, if this continues and we need to provide uh, <laughs> Any sort of answers to the questions will will be low. Sure, I'd like you to both plan on, um, well, Duke, uh, but Ross, I'd like you to be at the next meeting, and I think there may be some other questions, possibly from abutters, which we weren't able to get to tonight. So, with that, do I have a motion to continue? I'm sorry, Chuck. Just procedurally, so I think, if I recall correctly, I think Ross would reply to BSC's response to Ross's first letter, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I apologize sense? I didn't say that, but yeah, there yeah. were some questions that came up tonight. So we're, we would expect that information. Ross, do you have enough time uh, to get that to us? So our next meeting would be February 15th and that's 2-7. We need supplemental material. Yes, absolutely. I have drafted comments already, Mr. Chair, and in preparation for tonight, I can formalize those and send them over. Nathaniel, you uh, that with that? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. I just want to clarify that. Yeah. And I guess if right, and that also gives the applicants and anyone else, including Mr. Horsley, additional time to submit comments as well. I think. So, with, um, yep. Everyone, including the commission, can submit comments. Uh, between that time. So our submittal deadline, 2-7, for our next meeting on February 15th. We'll make a motion to continue the hearing to, uh, I know it said April. So February, February 15th. February, February, do I wish it was April? February 15th. I second. A second. Second. Thanks, uh, Susan, second. We're gonna uh, have a roll call vote. So uh, Brian McBride. Yes. David White. Oh, David's recused himself. Sorry about that. Uh, David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. 
And chair says yes. Kick okay, out everyone. So we're continuing this hearing until uh, February 15th. And if you have any questions or comments that uh, you'd like the commission to know in advance, please uh, send them to Ryan, uh, Ryan Clapp at the uh, conservation office. Um, outside of that, we're gonna move on right now to our next hearing. And that is DEP file number 913057 for a notice of intent for 51 Birch Street. This public hearing will be considered a notice of intent to demolish a single family dwelling and construct a two-family dwelling and associated apprentices at uh, 51 Burr Street um, within bordering land subject to flooding. And I know that LEC is here and Rich Kirby's here to discuss this. Rich, can you, um, I hope you can share your screen because I know that's usually what you do. Introduce yourself for the record and please take it from there. And Sure. Uh, good evening, Commission members. Uh, I'm Rich Kirby from LEC Environmental Consultants, and with me tonight, also from LEC, is Nicole Ferrara, um, Project Engineer Mike Novak, and Applicant Albert Aziantins. So um, what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole, who's going to run through the presentation, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Mike uh, to talk about the stormwater management design and the town engineer's review of that design. And then I think we'll turn it over to the commission for questions and discussion. So okay. with that, um, Nicole, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Rich. Would you mind, um, could you open up the plans? I wasn't able to get them on my laptop. Sure, of course. Thanks. Hold on just a second here. Okay, yes, many windows open, bear with me for just a moment. Okay. There we go. So here is the notice of intent application cover and I will scroll down to the site plan. Great. Uh, do you want um, the existing conditions uh, first? Yep, sure, that'd be great. So these are these existing conditions showing the um, current single family dwelling on the property. And it is um, mostly lawn in the backyard and it's, uh, you know, right off of Birch Street within bordering land subject to flooding, as Rich mentioned. Um, the bordering land subject to flooding occurs in the backyard area um, at elevation 6.8, so you can see it kind of cuts most of the property. And then there's a little portion of the existing driveway that is outside of the floodplain. Um, the backyard, as I said, is mostly lawn. There's a few scattered shade trees in the back. Um, there's a privacy fence surrounding the property as well. And the applicants are proposing to demolish this house and build a new uh, two-family dwelling. And they're gonna remove the existing driveway, walkway, and porch. Thanks, Rich. And this dwelling will be constructed atop piers so that the first floor elevation will be um, around four and a half feet above the floodplain elevation. And the structure will be supported by 23 building columns as shown on this plan here. And the project also includes two pervious paver driveways and porous paver walkways on the sides with steps and landings to access the units. And um, there's a deck proposed off the back of the property as well. Um, that'll be divided for the two, the two separate uh, dwellings. And then another privacy fence will be surrounding the property and there'll be um, four inches um, at the bottom that'll allow for like wildlife passage. 
And the, so the pervious paver parking areas will occur above the floodplain, but some work is proposed within BLSF, including um, elevating the driveways and walkways and the square building columns themselves um, to support the structure. So in terms of mitigation for this site, the applicants propose erosion controls um, along the limit of work line as shown, and there'll be, you know, the staked compost filter tubes, uh, as well as a construction entrance along the southern driveway. And Mike Novak, the project engineer, has designed a stormwater management plan to reduce peak rates and volumes. And um, so adding those two pervious paver driveways with the two feet of washed stone beneath the pavers will help capture that stormwater um, and infiltrate that. Uh, additionally, the compensatory flood storage is proposed within the backyard to mitigate for that proposed floodplain displacement. So grading for that um, is proposed within the lawn where that cursor is, yep. And the elevations will be lowered um, between 5.1 to 5.5, it looks like. And lastly, Rich, would you mind scrolling down to the landscape plan? Sure. Um, so on the landscape plan. Hold on, I gotta find it. <laughs> Here it is. So we included um, planting native sapling trees, shrubs, and ground cover. Um, and they're all derived from the recommended native plant materials list. And it'll be three native sapling trees, 46 shrubs, and 107 native perennials and grasses. Yep, as uh, shown on the plant schedule there. And then all five existing trees in the backyard will be protected with uh, tree protection fencing and the lumber board surrounding it. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Rich if you have anything else to add. Um, I don't think so. I think you covered it. Um, Mike, did you want to talk about the stormwater management? Uh, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the record, Mike Novak from Patriot Engineering. I'll keep it brief as you've had a lot of that already. Just a couple highlights of, of what Nicole has already talked about. Uh, we did conduct soil testing in the rear of the site. You can see those two test bits um, to the bottom of the screen as you as you look at this right now. Um, pretty consistent in terms of groundwater where we found it. Uh, both both holes were at 64 inches. Uh, they're slightly different in elevation, so they're they're essentially at the same uh, groundwater is essentially at the same elevation, floating between 5.5.5. So. Um, Excuse me. The test pits were at five point eight, five point five, with our with our uh, groundwater being sixty four inches below at each one. Apologies, that was confusing. Um, and just one other thing I wanted to highlight again. Rich has said we we did receive a review from the the town engineer, and I'm you know in my opinion, I feel as though that is a very very attainable comments, uh, mostly to do with detailing some some information on the stormwater system that I wanted to talk about. We're showing the driveways as um, pervious paver. Uh, open jointed previous paver, but the actual stormwater management is only taken into account for the length of the building. In other words, the per the previous paver that I'm modeling is just the length of the building from top to bottom of the page. Um, everything else will be built the same, but I'm not actually taking any any credit for it to try to be uh, very conservative because we have a we don't have great soil out here, so I wanted to try to make sure that we were really trying to do a, a decent reduction in, in both volume and, and uh, runoff. So I feel as though we, um, in the in the review from the engineer, it, it seems that he agrees. He just wants some details as to understand what's what's going on, and just um, this, the same will be done for the pavers in front as well. As you can see, those are called uh, proposed paver walkways. Those are oh, those don't say pervious, but they will in the final plan. Uh, so again. And then underneath the building is is um, is stone as as Nicole mentioned. Uh, so I think you know, those are the highlights. Um, happy to answer any questions, Rich. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I just wanted to go over a couple more things. Um, 
With respect to the um, the flood storage, if you look at the calculations that we provided, we, we are providing a 10 to 1 ratio of commensurate flood storage. Um, the amount of flood, flood storage availability will basically be increased by 10 times with uh, by removing the house and lowering the grades. Um, so that that helps us, you know, promote climate resiliency in accordance with the bylaw regulations. Um, as Nicole mentioned, we're also elevating the first floor elevation four and a half feet above the floodplain elevation, which all the mechanicals and things will be above the floodplain elevation as well. So we're promoting climate resiliency in that way. Um, <clears throat> and I, and I think that, I think that was it. That's really all I wanted to add, but happy to turn it over to the commission to answer any questions. Thanks, Rich. Um, yeah, I reviewed this uh, application. I thought that uh, <laughs> yeah, you've proven that you've been to Arlington a few times. It was well put together. Um, Thanks. I don't don't really have uh, any questions, but I think the well, you know, actually, I'll leave it up to Susan because I know that she's going to ask the question I was just about to. So, Susan, please take take over here. I don't know if I have ESP Chuck, so I'm going to ask my own question. <laughs> um, well, first, I'm going to say uh, I really appreciate um, th the team putting together a very comprehensive and clear um, NOI, and I, I do appreciate you addressing our climate change resilience regulations in our local wetland re regulations, because sometimes we have to specifically ask for that and continue to get that information um, because it's not addressed. So I, I truly appreciate that. Um, I'm impressed with this project, um, raising, raising the, you know, changing that that footprint, taking it out of the floodplain, um, and the compensatory flood storage um, increase will really help the environment as well as um, climate change. I did. I just had one small question about roof roof runoff, um, and is hmm. that going to be handled um, by just the pavers? Was that calculated there? Maybe I missed that. No, yes, if I may. Again, Mike mm -hmm. Novak. Um, I, it will be short answer. It, okay. The, the stone volume underneath the paver section that I pointed out that runs along the runs along the house was specifically designed to capture the roof runoff for all the stone events. Um, okay. That's great. that's really the only place that's generating any runoff in regards right. to solid impervious. Okay. So that's exactly what we did. It's, it, it, because of the, the nature of the size of the site and, and because of the, the groundwater um, challenges, I felt as though trying to force a system, uh, you know, subsurface system in here didn't make sense. So we're just taking advantage of the, the volume under the driveway. And also, we don't have a foundation to worry about putting putting groundwater against. So we're really going to have more than what I'm showing. But as I said, I specifically designed and, and detailed for the roof runoff. Right. And because there's no basement, there's no right. flooding issue. Um, and then I just had one more comment. Um, I, I, I'm pleased to hear that the town engineer reviewed this before it came to us again. Sometimes that's a, another step we have to take after the fact. Um, have you addressed all his comments and recommendations? I, I have and will be. Uh, I don't think you have the final version right. of that. But um, we, I wanted to, since we were we were up against coming to the meeting, I wanted to incorporate any commission comments as well and issue one final plan. Hopefully, that makes everyone happy. Great, thank you very much. Sure. Back to you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go with Dave Kaplan. Thanks, Chair. Yep, and thanks again for a comprehensive and well written. Well, well put together application. Um, uh, just curious, and forgive me if I missed it in the application. Um, how did you determine your groundwater elevations in the area? Since we just spent so much time talking about it in the last uh, hearing. I it, it, yeah, you, you sure did. Um, <laughs> very similar to how the, uh, for ease of, of explanation, very similar to how the applicant uh, of your previous project and their, and their witness um, did it. Dug a hole, we looked at modeling, and I had weeping in these holes, so there was very clearly a, a set groundwater, um, and there was no evidence that it was it was there. We we did this early, uh, let me just check. 
uh, early November. So, I mean, we had had a pretty decent amount of rain uh, through there too. So I feel comfortable as we were getting an accurate picture of what would be a, a um, more of a higher level groundwater. Um, and again, ba watching the, the last hearing, you know, in the, in having the groundwater be, you know, in the, in the, in the area that it is um, 60 inches below kind of, kind of goes with uh, what, what we're seeing because they're a little higher. We're a little higher over here, I think, based on some of the elevations. Um, I don't think we go quite as low, but I, I, I was, I was half listening. So don't quote me on that, but <laughs> the long, the short answer is, is that uh, typically how I've done these in, many in the past is, is we had a machine, we excavated, we observed a, an open hole. Um, and like I said, I had standing water to, to be able to base, my assumption wrong. Okay, so it's standing water and not not modeling. Okay. There was no there was no evidence of modeling above above where we where we saw um right. estimated right. season high. So the, the, yeah, you, and the soil type indicated that that's pretty much where it stays. Um, I don't think it has a lot of ability to move back and forth. It's not great stuff out there. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. I think when Nathaniel had his hand up, Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks, Chuck. Um, thanks, Mike. Sorry, I, can you just point me to where I had essentially the same question David did in light of our yep. prior discussion? <laughs> of but, course, uh, I, I was kind of expecting you, this. Yes. Okay, so, in, in that light, um, can you point me to where in the application you have the test pit data shown that you know has the soil soil depths and shows where they're uh, modeled? Yeah, I think Rich actually pulled it up. It's actually on my plan. It's on the second. It's on the second sheet of the of the plant set. Um, oh, okay. and, then, and the locations are shown on the first sheet. Um, uh, they're both okay. done in the, yeah, so. Okay, thanks. I was just trying to apply sure. Good. No problem. Uh, and like I said, it's it's not great stuff out there. So, um, you know, the silt loom, there's definitely a layer that's been brought in over there. And then and then it's just a silty loom, which makes sense as you move away from the site into what you guys were just talking about, you get into a ton of wetlands. So again, that, that kind of soil transition makes sense where we know it's, we know it's damp over there. We know that area is always, somewhat wet so having having a, a not great draining soil just everything jived and, and it made sense that that's what we're looking at it's probably i would imagine no matter what time we dig out there we're probably going to find that groundwater that same in and around that same elevation all the time okay but just looking at this now you say that it was observed based on weeping not modeling you, so correct yeah terms. there's no okay. there was no yeah so i had i had water coming into the hole um, in other words, the sides showed actual water flowing in. And then what, so when I see that, what I do is I leave that hole open. I go to the next one and we dig that one and we come back 10, 15 minutes later and the water levels out. And then from there, I look above to see if I notice there, there of any indication of whether or not this has surcharged, um, before. And I, and I know you've got a ton of information thrown at you and I'm probably going to make it even more confusing, but you know, one of the things that we look for is that that estimated seasonal high modeling or redox. Um, and the redox is an indication that it gets to that level many times, not just once. You know, if the water's up there one time in, in a, during a year, 14 years ago, it's not gonna leave enough evidence to really see. But when it's there consistently, that's when you get the oxidation, that's when you get the mineral leaching. So then you can say, okay, look, the water's here, but wait a minute, there's evidence that it can get up to here. Now it may not be there when you're in the hole at that time, but that's, so that's why it's estimated seasonal high. That's what we're looking for. And I saw no evidence of that in both holes. So I called yeah. the water. Yeah. So once the water had settled out in terms of, you know, 10, 15 minutes after we've, we've disturbed the soil and, and you can see that the water has reached level, we've all heard the term water finds its level. That's when I make my call. Okay, so all right, so I misunderstood. I thought you said you no did problem. base base your water level on uh, on modeling, but no, you based it on the the, the actual water without the actual any, any additional observed. evidence of modeling. Right. So, Mike, for just to add a little bit of yeah, color here, please. If, if you saw that weeping at elevation at sixty four inches below the ground surface, right. but you know, maybe we were in a dry time of year. Maybe if you would have done this in August, perhaps if you, you know, you would have seen weeping at 84 inches, but right. you may have, you may have seen some redox features above the weeping. And then in that case, you would use those redox features as your estimated seasonal high groundwater. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. You know, considering the time of year I was out there, 
and not right. seeing any, any additional modeling, I felt confident that that's where the my water was. Had it been August and we hadn't had rain in six weeks and we were deeper, I would have probably really tried to look for something expecting it to be higher, knowing the area and knowing that that is an area that, you know, Thorndike Field right around the corner holds water all the time. So there, there's part of it is knowing where you are, too, and, and your surrounding area. I know that that area of the town is is consistently wet with high groundwater. So we put all those factors together to make that determination. It's not just one look in the hole. There it is. We're done. Uh, I hope that sure, helps. Right. In, in terms of actually seeing water present. Yeah. Right. Okay. Correct. Okay. So, so that test bit data you just presented, you you actually did not make any notation about where the modeling occurred because you didn't see it above. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Just correct. I could I could certainly add a note that says no no evidence of modeling observed. Um, right. That okay. But that helped be helpful. Implied. Yeah. Yes, it's implied. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Helen Coleman, uh, see your hand up. Floor is yours. Yeah, I almost forgot what my question was. Um, can can somebody tell me please how big the footings are? And I asked because I've been surprised before by a project that in a different town where the footings ended up being thirty six inches, and that was actually filled quite a lot of floodplain. And the second one is. I think you're going to re have to reiterate this because I just didn't grasp it if you said it. Can you explain how your porous pavers are working? I mean, how, how big are the gaps between your pavers and how much um, stone is going underneath that's containing? Because I have didn't have a chance to look at the stormwater plan or stormwater report. Sure. Please. sure. We, um, the, since Rich is pulling that up, thank you, Rich. That's the, the detail on the, uh, there we go. That's the detail of what the, the paver driveway will look like in the portion that it, it'll all look like this, but this is the portion that is designed to mitigate the stormwater runoff. So you see that it has uh, two inch wash stone for a depth of starting at elevation four going up to elevation six. And then from there, we we, we have a two inch uh, choker course. Uh, that's just some smaller stone. What that does is that slows that initial water. We don't want it flying right through. We want to, we want to we want to pull it down, slow it down, spread it out. And then in between the paver blocks, we'll have an inch void, which will just be filled with like a chip stone. But it won't be compacted or there won't be anything put in it for a binding agent. It'll just be to fill in the gap so the stones don't move. Um, so the idea is, is that it, it gets through the, it gets through the chip stone pretty quickly, gets slowed down by the choker storm. And then when it gets into the larger stone, it has a bunch of voids. It fills out, spreads out, so we get infiltration. Uh, throughout the whole surface area of that driveway, not just point so straight down, which, as we just learned, um, you know, we have to worry about uh, mounding. So we want to spread this out so we don't send every drop of water into one spot. So I hope that sheds a little light on it. Uh, yeah, now I forgot and... the other question. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Rich. Oh, uh, sorry. I was just going to add in part of the reason that there's, you know, two feet of washed stone beneath the... Um beneath the pavers. Normally, if this was just a pervious paver driveway and we were, you know, just making it pervious so the driveway was pervious, there'd be much less than two feet of washed stone. But because we're directing the clean roof runoff to this area for infiltration, Mike has increased that depth significantly in order to provide additional void space for that water to go to. So there's two so this is a... Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, it's Mike here. I just... It seems to say two inches of washed stone. You're right. No, that's uh, just the uh, that's just the size of the washed stone. Oh, it's two, yeah, I'm sorry. Two inch yeah, it's two inch washed stone. See elevations below. So the the material is two inch washed stones. The elevation is uh, two feet top to bottom. Uh, yeah. So Rich, and just to kind of put a bow on what you said, you know, this typically you, you you're used to seeing a cross section of an of an infiltration system. This was basically the stone. Um, the stone box that this would be put in, I just made the stone big enough so where we didn't need any chamber voids in between. Uh, it, it's, it's, so I hope that kind of helps a little bit. And I think the other question was the size of the piers? Yeah, size of the piers, because there's quite a lot of them, I think. Yeah, there is. They were accounted for in the flood storage volume. Um, I tried to pull it up i don't have it in front of me they're not three by three like you just said they're i think they're at best 
12 inch by 12 inch rich if you happen to know jump in but I, i'm not sure that, that would have been on the on the architectural plans right yeah i i, I can probably try to dig them up but i don't have them open and yeah. accessed right now but i know they're not three by three that's for sure uh but i know as well they were also the 23 of them i believe remember is the area of those were accounted for in each flood elevation albert do you know albert uh um, oh, do you I know what point. those piers are hey rich yeah those piers are uh they're gonna be about 12 inches okay 12 by 12. that's my five one by one right yeah 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 so we, just we to, accounted just, for... just to just to tie a bow on it could you could you just show the the the, sure. the versus the fill again as you're talking yep the um the plan is here let me zoom in um So these little squares where it says proposed foundation pier, these are the individual piers. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, no, thirteen, I, I meant fourteen, the numbers. fifteen. Do, do, do you have the numbers for what that's doing versus the? Oh, the uh, um, so yes, yeah, so the um, yep, the floodplain storage numbers are also on the plan. And I talked with Mike, and we're gonna on the revised plan. We're gonna present this a little bit differently. Right now, what we have is the um, the area and volume that uh, a floodplain that currently exists on the site. So, for example, between elevations 5.3 and 5.5 on the site, that represents roughly 170 square feet and provides 30 cubic feet of volume. With the grading that's proposed and removal of the house, um, this land between elevation 5.3 and 5.5 will occur within 302 square feet and provide 91 cubic feet of flood storage volume. So we sort of have an existing and proposed. What Mike's going to do is revise this table uh, for the revised plan that talks about proposed fill within the floodplain between each of these elevations and then the corresponding compensatory flood storage provided for each of the elevations. Right. So I, I hope that answers your question. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. You all set? Okay. So uh, I heard uh, revised incorporate engineering's notes, things like that. Uh, it sounds like you're not intending to request closing tonight. Unfortunately, I don't think we're positioned to do that. Um, we would like to request a continuance so Mike sure. can get the revised plans in. Oh, Mike can get the revised plans into you um, in advance of the next hearing. Sure, that makes um, a lot of sense. I'm just going to go over what I heard. Um, we'd like, I don't know if there was one, but if there was, we'd like an engineering memo. We'd like to incorporate um, uh, like uh, notes uh, on the plan that says there was no modeling. I guess that's on the stormwater report. You're going to update the plans and you're going to revise the flood storage numbers. Oh, and then uh, whatever the comments that the engineers uh, in the town had, you're going to incorporate those comments. That's what I have as well. Great. Oh, and we can continue to the, the sure. last meeting. Yep, and that's the fourteenth. And you got a second. Okay. Brian uh, McBride. Sorry, slow off mute. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gillis game. Yeah. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, okay. great. Thank you Thank very much. You. And what was the date of that public hearing? Uh, the next one is uh, February 15th. 15th, okay. But Rich will need the information by the 7th. That's right. right. Um, to get I, have, seven. Um, yeah. I have two other hearings scheduled that night. One is in person, one is remote. And given that... Um, most of these comments are engineering driven. I think Mike, you might have to Mike and Nicole will have to uh, attend that one. Yeah, I can I can do that, Rich. That's fine. Okay. 
All right, great. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good night. And um, yep, thank you. See you thank soon. You. Yeah, thank you. thanks. All right. So next on our agenda, we have a uh, amended order of condition for the Arlington Reservoir. It's DEP file number 91-327. And um, at the public hearing that we will consider an application to amend the existing order of conditions at the Arlington Reservoir for cleaning of sediment and debris uh, from a bridge surface and milling and overlaying the existing bituminous pavement on the bridge and formalizing an existing pathway on either side of the bridge with bituminous concrete within the buffer zone to a bordering vegetated wetland. Who do we have here tonight to represent this project? And could you introduce yourself uh, for the record? Yes, that's me, Danielle Desolette with Kyle Zick, Landscape Architecture, uh, the designer for the Reservoir Project. Hi. Nice to see you all. Nice to see you. Do you have a presentation for the commission? And do you have, I do, I have... screen sharing uh, ability there, Ryan? Yep, I was just going to let, I think Leslie is here on behalf of the Recreation Committee, too. Hello, yes. Res Leslie. Joe couldn't be here. I'm representing the commission. Okay, let's get started. All uh, right, let's see. Whoops. Oh, okay. Oh, you've got it. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so that's a quick summary. Here is what um, Chuck just shared. So this is a to kind of complete the project at the res. Um, there was a little component that did not get installed. It wasn't part of the project. Um, that was basically the connection at um over the bridge at drake village to make the connection they have since done um a gateway project and so we just want to make the connection from where we ended our um pervious pavement system that connects from the perimeter uh loop around the res to to their gateway at drake village um if you don't mind going to the next slide we have a couple images there. So this is the current condition. So there's some old bituminous pavement on the bridge itself. Um, so we'd clean up all the sediment um, and the aggregate that's there, remove the bituminous, um, use that as base material, just like we did at the um, herd field connection, um, and then make the connection over the bridge with new um, bituminous pavement. We, we can see the edge of the previous pavement is in the top image there. And we go right up this um, to make the connection to Drake right below the um, cut, probably cut there. The edge of the uh, Batu's pavement, just so we have a clean edge. Um, so the next image just shows the same, the view from the other side. That's the Drake, then their new gateway with bench and seating pad. And then the next is just a couple more images of um, the conditions again for coming down from the Drake connection, the state of the bituminous. And that's the pathway that was installed with the riprap swale for um, the accessible path, accessible and pervious path um, connecting to the perimeter trail. So, uh, and then, <laughs> the, thank you. The next, that slide is the plan itself. So you can see we're proposing, the bridge is a little bit wider, um, but we're proposing just a six foot wide pathway. Um, of bituminous to connect the width of the previous pavement to the Drake connection, um, and then infill the edge of the the bridge abutments um, with a three quarter inch wash aggregate, um, and then we'll have silt fence and compost filter socks for for construction, just as we did for the herd field connection, and that the last those three. Um, big X's, those are those were removed as part of the res connection. So we're not removing any vegetation um, unless it's weeds that are growing in the current sediment on the bridge itself. Um, the last page there is just the um, the details for the filter stock, the silt fence, the wash aggregate layer, and then the bituminous pavement. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Um... Uh, Leslie, did you want to add anything to that, or should I go to the commission members? You know, feel free to go to the commission members. Sure. Uh, anyone on the commission have any questions about this project? Uh... Chuck, I do. Oh, sorry, Brian. Sure, it's oh. hard to see. Uh, but uh, yeah. sure, Susan, if you want to go first, we'll let you. 
Okay. Um, I just have some comments. So I did a, a site walk down there just because I was doing a site walk for a uh, our, one of our CPA um, projects to look at enhancement of uh, the bank um, and riparian habitat for Millbrook up in that area, which is awesome. <clears throat> and um, I just looked at that area and totally agree it needs to be uh, fixed up. I mean, this is definitely a um, forgotten child and just we didn't get it in the project. So so I, I just want to lend my support um, to doing this amendment. But at the same time, I just want to put a bug in everybody's ear. Um, and I don't have my pictures here, but I'd like to do that at another time. This is a, there's a kind of a cul culverted underneath this bridge area. It's a pedestrian bridge. Is it there's concrete, and Millbrook gets condensed and 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 kind of um, moved in a certain way, um, which I discuss with Hatch Engineering and Duke Bisco, who's doing that other project said, you know, that may not be what you want to do. And at some point you might want to consider a CPA project to just make a pedestrian bridge and open that up underneath so that the so that Millbrook can have its flow. So I'm just putting a bug in everybody's ear while we've got you all here. Um that 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 may be something we want so, to consider as a town later. So on. just to get this right, Duke was um suggesting that we build open another bridge up. that meets stream crossing standards. Exactly. And because it's just a pedestrian bridge, mm -hmm. it would be easy to build. It doesn't have to handle any, um, you know, traffic and that sure. it would be. So I'm just I'm just relaying that information. Understood. Thank you. Uh, Brian McBride, I know you had your hand up. You took it down. Just a quick question for Danielle. I don't think you page up to the pictures of the foliage around the bridge. I'm just wondering what the current status of the uh, uh, flora is around the bridge and if there's a opportunity now or sometime in the future to plant native species and to uh, get it more where we want it to be. There's a pretty good mix of things in there. I know I see look at the images, nori maples, and looks like there's some bittersweet in there. So there's some of that, you know, <laughs> <Is that pretty laughs> on that edge. Um, we're not with the space that we have and we're, we're, dealing strictly with the bridge and just a little bit above it to make that connection to Drake. So we don't have a whole lot of space. Um, we weren't planning on removing any uh, vegetation to do that um, at this point, but um, certainly if there's a future project in it with the pedestrian bridge, that there would be some some potential there to create new connections and, and enhance the plantings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, David White. Um. One question, since it's um, asphalt, are there runoff issues to consider, erosion possibilities? So the bridge itself will be fairly flat in the, the, cross, the connection that we're doing. Um, the, the connection to the res is a pervious material and we have that swale on that side of it. Um, so there shouldn't be, and then, then we have on either side, so it's only a six foot path to connect with, with the image. You can see the, the 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 width of the previous pathway that's there, we're connecting with that. So there is a strip, maybe 18 inches on either side, and that's where we're doing that three quarter inch washed aggregate, which is similar to what we did at the herd field connection, just to, if there is any flow that it would connect, uh, collect it and, and kind of capture it there. The aggregate, okay. I don't see any other questions. Um, I don't see anybody else with their hand up. Uh, is So with that, is there anyone attending tonight's meeting that would like to make a comment about this project? Please raise your hand or use, you can raise your hand just in front of the camera or you can just use the reactions button and hit the raise hand function. Uh, we'll go right to you. And I don't see anyone on my screen. They usually pop to the top. So I'm going to say no one's here for this project. So I had a couple questions. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that uh, who maintains this bridge after it's finished? Is is this par park and rec land, Leslie? And so if something happened, it would be the DPW. It's it, Yeah. I mean, it's it would be similar to anything that would go along the pathway. Um, 
it would be viewed, you know, very much like the connection that is made between Heard Field and the and the bridge. It's not the um, it's not the housing people. You know, we were waiting. Mm -hmm. They did their they did their project, and you know, part of what we did was wait to see exactly how far they were going to get with their project. Um, so they didn't come across, they didn't come beyond the fencing area and they didn't come across the bridge, but much like with the herd project, if there's something along the uh, pathway or the bridge, it would be DPW. Okay. Um, so you're going to mill and overlay this, uh, the machine that gets out there, is that, is that a truck or is there a smaller version of that? And that doesn't really need to be answered. I'm wondering with the culvert underneath, do we need to worry about that agitation making, uh, I don't know, material loose and dropping into the stream or or not? I'm not sure. So that's my question. I, there, I'll just so, say that the, the detail that we use for the herd uh, connection over that bridge is the same. So we have, in addition to the the compost filter stuff. We also have that silt fence detail that wraps around, so we make sure that any of the that comes down yeah. and wraps. It's on the last page there. Um, no, so I get sure what's happening on the here. top. I was just wondering inside when you, sh oh, when you oh, shake oh. the whole the whole thing. Did, did you notice any of that on the last on the last one? Was there any about that? Okay, yeah, it's just, it's culvert, so they're pretty much solidly filled with soil above yeah. that. You know, I, I understand that. Okay. That was that was my uh, trying to move it along. So that was my question. So I'm gonna. Can you take uh, down the screen screen sharing, please? Okay. So I'm trying to motion, move. Sure. Motion to approve the amendment. amended. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. The, 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 approve the request to amend the existing work conditions under the bylaw and the Wellness Protection Act. Great. Can I get a second? Second. Sure. Uh, any, uh, so, uh, okay, let's take a vote. Um, uh, Wait, David. Can, you, can you just do one discussion item? Just I just want to make for the record, we have standard special conditions that have to do with erosion controls and sedimentation and things like that, which will be in place on this. They're nothing new to you, Leslie or Danielle. You've seen them before at the previous yeah. projects, right? If we well, need it's to. Part of, it's not, amending, yeah. right. We're amending, so it's probably already. Right, so it's probably in. already in there. Yeah. We should just take a look and make sure because we have modified our um, special you conditions. Can, you can add time. a condition right now if you want, but if you don't, it's what was in the old order. What was in the order already? Okay. Yeah. So I, 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 I rescind that. I just I thought there was a close that. and an issue, but if this is just an issue, then if anyone has any conditions, you know, speak now and we'll just, and we'll add it in. Okay. I'm okay with that, with Nathaniel's okay. reminder. Okay, seeing Thank none, you. I'm going to run down. Uh, Brian McBride. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gill, this game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. <laughs> yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. All right, you're all set. Amended order of conditions. Uh, you can... Uh, call Ryan tomorrow or reach out to him through email and he'll let you know when he can get that information out to you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you all very much. Very Good much. night. Nice. All right. Good so then, um, Susan, get, get ready. So the next one uh, is a request of determination for 35 Beverly Road. And Susan's going to run this uh, agenda, but I figured I would just... Uh, Look at her and see if she's ready, and she looks ready now. So take it away, Susan. Okay. Um, so this is um, let's see. request for determination of applicability at 35 Beverly Road. This public hearing is considering an application for a seasonal floating dock at 35 Beverly Road along the bank and land underwater of Mystic Lake. And Ryan Clapp and I did a site visit for this property, um, I believe it was the January 14th. Um, we were supposed to have the hearing for the meeting of the 18th. However, our um, notices, uh, public notice didn't get out in time. So that's why this has been continued. So um, Ryan's put up 
the plan for the seasonal dock. And those of you who remember the seasonal dock just right down the street that we permitted, that we did a, an RDA for previously, um, that one was already there. This one is not existing. This is a new dock that the um, residents, the applicants want to put in. And you'll see the dock is, is kind of an L shape. It will have pilings um, that go in and um, the applicant has uh, explained that those will be hand um, hand put in. There'll be no machinery that's, that's pounding those into the water. Um, and then there's a small ramp to get to it. This is a very, very steep, property, there's a steep slope down to the water. And um, that's something to consider. I think it would be helpful if you put up our pictures, Ryan, and our discussion. Um, that might be helpful. So Ryan did a, um, a, a small summary of this project and he and I, um, walked the site just so you can see. So this is looking down towards, um, you could get an idea of the steepness. That's Mystic Lake. That's the, the other edge of the property. Whoops. <laughs> okay, so this is down right near the water. That's kind of what it looks like now. Um, there's some stone on the edge, and then there's also some concrete stones um, on on the bank um, existing. And there's a, a small kind of fence that that was just put up there to prevent the geese from coming up, but it's kind of uh, not not quite anchored in there. This I oh you could put that up, Ryan. Um, I just want to say that um, the, so this is a proposal for a seasonal dock. And as we've discussed before, seasonal means it goes in at a certain time of year and it comes out at a certain time of year. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, um, as I said, the site is, is steep. The, um, the applicants also talking about um, doing some additional work on the site, which we explained to them would be uh, another RDA or NOI, depending upon how much additional work they want to do. And this RDA is just for the seasonal dock. Um, currently, the property owner has also installed a gravel pad directly adjacent to the lakeshore, which I'd like to show you. Um, Ryan has a picture of it, um, which has their um, jet ski sitting on it out of the water. And this might be something that the commission wants to consider um, requiring the applicant to move. It's right on the edge of the water. Um, and as we've discussed with seasonal docks coming out of the water, they should come out and above the 25 foot um, no disturb zone. Um, and I would recommend that we consider asking the applicant to move this as well at the same place that the seasonal dock would be going. Um, I don't know if you have any more pictures. Um, that's the edge of the property. Other side. Um, that's somebody else's dock next door. <laughs> Yep, that's what I was about to say. You can see the pilings so Susan, on that one. Okay, um, you can see the pilings on that one, and that's what these pilings would be. Susan, I'm yes. a little confused. Uh, yeah. well, uh, you're presenting this project for the applicant, or are you just doing a... I was just explaining depth, what we saw in um, the site visit. Sorry. Oh, sure. Can you just... Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd like to get, say, the, like the, get to the applicant. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> sure, no problem. So, right. um, and nice. the applicant is here. Um, I see them, I think. Well, yes, we're here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Hi. And if you could please introduce yourselves, and I'm sorry if I stole your thunder. I was trying to be thorough about the site visit. No, we appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm Thomas Schnelldorfer, and my wife, Mayling Chu, is um, here. Yeah, so I just want to preface it, uh, something as well. Uh, we actually have been living in uh, this house, uh, this, uh, this location since 2010. When we actually bought the property, uh, there used to be already an existing dock on this property, not when we bought it, but there was one, uh, we actually have photos of it, but there was one, uh, a dock there 
I think in the seventies or eighties, um, and that was removed. Not it, they, the owners had removed it, but not because of the commission or so. So there was an existing dock on this property previously. So just um, just to preface that, but yes, so we are looking at a um, a float a seasonal floating dock uh, to be placed and. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of homes are on this lake that also have uh, docks and the dock company that we have looked into uh, actually placed a lot of these docks that are on this lake as well as the upper Mystic Lake with the Winchester Boat, uh, Boat Club. So they are very familiar with this area as well. Okay. Uh, I think between that and what Susan did, we have a good understanding of the project. I only had one question. When the dock comes out, was there a distance from um, the water where you're going to store it? Was it outside the 25 foot area? Do we know that 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 uh, measurement? So yeah, I mean, um, we have, as you can see, there's plenty of space to put it. So we can absolutely put it 25 feet away from it. That's not a problem. Okay. Okay. And Susan, was that, does that concur with your site visit? Like 25 feet away would be adequate for storing the dock? Yes. And um, I, I did want to ask the applicant since, you know, one or two questions. One is, are you willing to move the jet ski pad if the commission I'd like to hear from other commissioners if that's a concern of theirs. And then um, what were the dates you were considering um, having the dock go in and come out every year? Well, we don't have anything, you know, set in stone because, you know, the, the weather always changes as well. And mm -hmm. since we're not necessarily doing it ourselves, um, this company that we're using, WM Docks, uh, they've been doing this for over 20 years and they can do the install and the removal. And that will also depend on their schedule. Um, so depending on what are the requirements are, obviously we can, you know, let them know so they can you know, incorporate that into their schedule as well. But we are bound by, you know, the schedule. As well. Sure, sure. I see that Nathaniel has his hand up. Nathaniel? Thanks, a um, couple of questions. Um, I'm sorry, just to understand. So this is a floating dock with piles or piles that sort of uh, align where the dock is floating. Is that correct? They're kind of twisted into the ground, the piles. Okay, um, so those are twisted into the ground, but the so the dock's not ret it's not those aren't supporting the dock, they're just placing the dock. I believe right. it is. From floating, floating away. away. No. Right. Oh. Floating away. Okay, got it. Thanks. All right. That makes sense. Um, what type of decking are you? proposing to use it's aluminum frame aluminum frame, aluminum okay, frame is aluminum decking too yeah I'm aluminum. Trying. it's also aluminum decking aluminum decking okay because there's floats underneath it right okay right. um so there's no no opportunity for light to penetrate it's a solid there is, there is. Um, it's the aluminum um decking has some kind of like opening so there's some light that goes through okay awesome thanks okay those are my only questions about the dock um for that, it seems I, I would just also comment that we did give permission to one of your neighbors to have we set a conditions on the dock that it needs to be pulled out. Uh, remind me November by November fifteenth of each year, and then kept out until April fifteenth of the following year. So just wanted to make sure you could live with those. April fifteenth and November fifteenth, correct? Yeah, exactly. Correct. Yeah. Then you yeah. could put them, you know, obviously yeah, you after could. you know. But just you not. Put, yeah, you, yeah, yes. It can be in the water. It needs to be out of the water from November 15th to April 15th, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so that's all I had on the dock comment. And I think um, I'm, I agree with Susan. I think after we discuss the dock, we could address the uh, the jet ski ramp issue. But I don't think those two should be, those two are necessarily related to the, um, necessarily combined, but I could be convinced otherwise. Um, so that that's a good question, Nathaniel. I didn't know. So they didn't ask an RDA for where the jet ski should go. Obviously, it was just a seasonal dock. And then we noticed that the jet ski is here. Should that be included in this RDA or not? Well, it's it's not. I guess they could uh, seek to continue it. I guess. 
in my mind, I, I guess one thing to ask is if if they get approval for this dock, do they anticipate that that jet ski would be removed? Yeah, so um, just to clarify, it's not a fixed structure. These are just rails that lay on the ground. And so we looked into that um, option. So these rails are, are basically allow the jet ski to be pulled in by hand. And so there are no rails that are 25 feet long because you couldn't pull it that far by hand. So the only suggestion that was brought um, by the company, which honestly doesn't make any sense to put build in a crane to do that. Mm -hmm. We're obviously not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have any options. I've seen other people have sort of attachments to their dock that they could pull their jet skis onto. I have a client on the Cape who had that, but that was on the ocean. Yeah, I, I asked the company and um, they said they don't have anything that long. And it would also kind of be a concern in terms of the strength on it. Um, so they, they basically said they, um, they wouldn't recommend it. Okay. All right. So it sounds like... Um... I guess we need to deal with it with that the railings separately uh, would be my thought. I mean, before as they have the dock up, uh, the, you know, the request for the dock. Um, I guess we've never seen railings before like this placed on a bank. Um, no. Well, I is there, a, is there a better picture of those railings? I, I saw a stone. Um, yeah, um, uh, the stone under it. Um, I think there is a better picture. And while we're trying to find it, Mike, did you have a question related to this or is it an, in a it different... It is related to this. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. about the no disturb zone that you mentioned, 25 feet. I'm wondering if what, uh, what the... And I'm not familiar with this, but if the regulations uh, also include impact to that zone by the actual moving of the dock, because that's going to take some uh, some muscle or some machine or something... And is that going to be consistent with the no disturb zone because of compaction or whatever it may be from the moving process? Good question. Um, we we did discuss that briefly at the at the other hearing, and um, we erred on the side of the importance of a seasonal dock coming out of the water at a certain time, and and we said that they have to have minimal disturbance to the bank um, and the 25 foot, but um, Chuck or Nathaniel, do you remember differently? Uh, I don't remember yeah. differently. No. no. I had a different question. Oh, okay. The more, the, the more I'm thinking about this, I think we should deal with a dock and then deal with, I think we need more information about this jet ski. Okay, and do that uh, thing Because I'm seeing more things in this photo that are not making me comfortable about it. Um, right. So I think if they want to Either the commission can decide to take enforcement action about it because it's not permitted. It's work on the bank within the buffer zone that's not permitted. Um, so we can take enforcement action. We can work, you know, or continue, you know, very levels of, of enforcement or, you know, work with the applicant to see about filing a separate application to get this thing permitted. But I don't think that we should necessarily hold tie or connect this pending request with Got it. this issue. That makes sense. So I don't know if that, that makes sense to you. Um, what Nathaniel's saying is in the process of permitting the dock, we see that you have a, you have a jet ski here, which is in an area that's protected um, in the town and in the state. So it's really not allowed there. So we could deal with it two ways. One is you do well, a well, it's not. It's, it's, they don't have no. permission. Permit, permission, have to permission, to permission, to permission to put it there. It Sorry. Yes. And, no right, permission right. to put it there. So at this point, we can deal with it one of two ways. I think Nathaniel is saying one is through um, a separate letter of, you know, or enforcement, and one is through a separate RDA, which you're doing now for the for the um, dock, but it would be separate for this for this jet ski structure or storage. So at this point, I think we'll just focus on the dock, like yeah. things, because that's what this RDA is about. Right. And that makes sense, guess, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna suggest, if we can put on our agenda discussing this as a potential enforcement action at our next meeting, then we can, I think, given the late hour, I, you know. I, yeah, we don't wanna discuss it now. Discuss okay, it. I mean, and I want, we need we more information. The sure. more information and we can sure. certainly yeah certainly invite the homeowner to attend that meeting and participate in that discussion if needed. Sounds but, good. Um, 
I'd Sounds say good. We leave it at that. Sounds good. So um, are there any other um, comments from commissioners? Oh, my hand went down. Oh. Sorry. I did. That's I, okay, Chuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I, you know, I was going to ask something about this, this uh, jet ski also. I'm just going to do it real quickly. <clears throat> you know, there might be another way to, uh, to store this and you might want to look into it. Uh, but it sound it looks like to me that maybe you could tie it to the dock during the summer and this area wouldn't be needed so much. Don't really need an uh, answer to that question. But um, Mike, I'll, I want to let you know when I called uh, DEP and asked them about the docks, they, they do want them out of the water and that they thought that um, any damage to <clears throat> the bank uh, there would be minimal damage to the bank. And since these, uh, this applicant's hiring a company, they wouldn't expect any damage to the bank for that. And I guess my final question would be, why can't the company move the, move the jet ski? If it's, I don't know how they're moving it. Maybe they won't lift it for people moving it. You know, I don't, I don't know if that was an option. I'm just going to leave it like that. Cause we're not going to talk about it at this meeting, but those are the only things I had. Thanks, I'll make Chuck. Motion to, I'll make a motion to issue a positive negative saying that yes, we have jurisdiction, but no, no further permitting is needed. But we have conditions. Uh, with the condition, sorry, yes, with the condition that is. So I, it's I would recommend two conditions. Did Are yeah. you going to do the conditions? No, go for it. I think they're the two that I'm going to do. But And okay. I have three additional ones. Oh, so. you have three. Okay, one is that the the, the dock, it's a seasonal dock that has to be removed between November 15th to April 15th, that we would require erosion and sedimentation controls for the bank during installation of the dock um, to make sure that we don't get any um, construction debris or anything in in the lake at that time. Those are the only two I had. Did you have another one, Chuck? Yeah, when they're removing the dock, they're not going to need erosion control. That's that's no, not... I'm saying constructing it. It's not there. You don't think they need any erosion controls when they're when they're constructing the dock and bringing the materials down? I, um, I, I don't. The dock okay. is one piece will come and it's basically putting there is the same as every season. You would take it out, take it in. There's not like any yeah, there's there's construction. There's, so there's it's no construction. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I so. take it's like Legos. They connect them. They slide. It's two pieces. They slide. Okay. And then they just put like the the pans and the the hinges on it. So there's okay. No Understood. Thank you. It comes already made, and I think the ramp just sits on the lawn. So, so yeah. she, Susan, you got all my uh, my condition stuff for one. I, if the bank is damaged, I would like you to install erosion control and reseed it, fix it and reseed it. So that would be an observation you make. And just to make sure that the dirt doesn't, during rainstorms, get into the mystic. So erosion control and then seed it. And those are observations that I, I think that you could cover. And then um, we, we said, so there are three, that when the dock comes out, it should be outside of the 25 foot zone and your vendor should be able to do that for you. Yeah. Season. Okay, Nathaniel. Right. So yeah, you still have a motion. My, that's, my, that's my motion. I Great. Just really keep a second. Oh, Is there second. a second? Who did that? Dave Kaplan, I think got Kaplan, it. Yep. Okay. Um, any further discussion? <laughs> okay. Um, then I will take a roll call vote. So I have David White. Yes. Thank you. I have um Brian McBride. Yes. Thank you. Chuck Taroni. Yes. Thank you. Dave Kaplan. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And I say yes. And so, so I. oh, I forgot Mike. Mike, yeah. Yildis game. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> the bottom of my screen. And you know, it's like who's where in the little boxes. Thanks, Mike. Um, so um, so that means that you will um you can put the stock in with those conditions. Ryan Clapp will get you the appropriate documentation for that. And we would we would ask you to come to our next meeting. Um, uh, likely, Ryan Clapp will be in, in contact with you um, to discuss further what to do about the jet ski. Okay. 
Thank you very much. I'm sorry it's so late. <laughs> Appreciate it. Back to you, Chuck. Okay, Susan, so we're back to the administrative uh, information. So I think the most important thing that we talk about is the Water Bodies Working Group. So I'm going to throw this right to David. Perfect, thanks. Wall. We, uh, do we want to take a motion to uh, continue 88 Coolidge? We haven't voted. A oh, is it? Uh, we're on to 88 Coolidge? I thought, okay, sure. Let's take a motion. That's to take a motion. Good. So moved. Yeah. Seconded. I can't do it. I can't, no, I can't do it. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gill's game. Yep. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David White. Okay. Yes. I, and I've lost track, so Chuck Troni says yes. Did if I missed Hi. anyone, just sing out now. Brian. 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 Sorry, Brian. Okay. I Brian. I was like, I don't need to vote. <laughs> no, Brian. Ryan. <laughs> Brian. No. no. No, I didn't so say Are we continuing this to 215 or yeah. further out? 215. Okay. 215. At least for the time being. Okay. Okay. So getting back to the discussions, uh, David White, I, we're going to do the annual report and then the contract on the water bodies working group. Okay. So David White and David Kaplan. Okay. We're still trying to work out the contract and budget issues. A long meeting last night about that. I sent around the um, current draft water bodies report, and there's several water bodies that need some attention in some ways. Um, I mentioned that the reservoir, basically we're doing a, it's a partial job for years and years. So we really need to think of doing a full job to really control the water chestnuts. The um, spy pond is always, is always a problem with us in some ways. We're trying to be more proactive in deciding how to do that in a minimal way, but still manage things. And that because it comes a budget issue, and how much money we can spend as well. And we had a talk last night with our person from the finance committee who said basically we should figure out how much it would take to do the job right and bring it forward to the finance committee for our next year's budget. And how much that is, is we're not quite sure yet, but it's going to be definitely more than we have in the past. Other comments, anybody? Anyone want to say anything about anything? I think uh, so comments about the uh, annual report? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I sent my comments in. They weren't uh, very substantive, but uh, I know that didn't Mike, Mike Gill's game, didn't you have some comments? I, that I did have a, just a couple of questions. One is, uh, and I think we talked about this in the past. Does it make sense for the town to purchase or purchase with renaming the town a, uh, a harvester that we would have on hand when we need it? And I don't know what the cost impact of that would be, but that way we could do the good job more mm. times. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good idea. David Morgan explored that last year and didn't get much traction with DPW. But we should definitely explore that going forward as a cheaper yeah, option than hiring somebody. It might somebody. be helpful to share it with Lexington or somebody, but I just don't know if that's a more efficient way to go about it because I agree that you do it once well and you get a much better bang for your buck. The only other question I had was about Hills Pond that I know there's a constructed wetlands there and I don't know if there are other uh, sources of pollution or uh, rainwater coming into the the pond, uh, and I don't know how effective that uh, constructed wetland is, and I don't know if any water quality testing has ever been done there. I mean, I yeah. think the aided buffer is a great idea around there, but I don't know about the other parts. Sure. There's a stormwater drain that enters into the pond. Right through that wetland that was constructed. Right, but my understanding too is that Water and Wetland is doing phosphorus testing. Yes. Um, because that's part of the permit. Uh, um, I haven't seen, I don't know if the two Davids have seen that data, but I haven't from last year. So that would be interesting to see. I actually, well. yeah, I actually asked Ellen, um, who's, who's kind of leading the friends group there, 
um, if we could have that report from last year, because I don't know if it was widely distributed. I didn't see it. So at least we know what's, you know, what they're monitoring and what they said at the end. Yeah, of we, can, we can send it around, I think. Yeah, that would be yeah. helpful. And so I think that might answer some of our questions, Mike. Yeah, we just want to get back on track here. We're reviewing the annual report. I right. know we could talk about every site, but that's not what we're doing here. We're just right. making sure that it has the stuff in it for the annual report because it needs to go to the finance committee. I also mentioned uh, in a comment the um, showing the harvester and the cost for a harvester and probably breaking it down and how long it would take to pay back. So that's come up a couple times, David. You guys might think about that. Any other comments about the annual report? I thought it was very well done. Um, <laughs> so generally, I mean, I, I appreciate your comments, Chuck and Mike, but I think generally it was pretty comprehensive. We talked Great. about that last night as well in terms of what it would cost to do the job right at the reservoir. We're talking, we estimated $55,000 per year for four or five years to bring the or chestnuts down to more manageable levels. That, mm -hmm. That's a number we should think about in terms of actually buying a harvester. And I know David Kaplan looked in some of these things last yeah. year. So we should. It was like a yeah. hundred and ten thousand, but the problem was no place to store it, and we don't really have a crew to run it. So. Um, those were a couple of hurdles that need to be discussed if you want to bring that up again to the finance committee. Well, otherwise, so, just, I mean, what we can propose is just hiring the current contractor for um, four weeks instead of two weeks. Mm -hmm. That's twice as much. And so we got to 55,000. We're just doubling the current contract. Right. So I guess your budget that you're going to put to the, the finance committee will have all the final review of all that, whether we're going up and down or wherever things are going, and that'll be presented to the Conservation Commission at that time, and we'll get more into this, exactly. uh, where to add money and why and what, why it makes sense. And that was gone, a lot of that was discussed last night, but it's it's still you know, conceptual. We need to get that on paper and, and back it up. But... Um, so it sounds like the water bodies report is accepted. Uh, can I uh, get a vote to accept it? Uh, the water bodies, is that what we do? Anyone says, no, it's fine. Yeah. I'll take a vote if accept it's fine. Accept it, accept it. And a vote to accept the water bodies. Uh, and Maybe some report. minor editings along the way, but it's basically. Right. So moved with the edits as, as given to David, as sent to David White and Dave Kaplan. Second. Second. Okay, Mike Gildas game. I'm just going loudest. We go loudest sometimes. <laughs> okay, so uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. <laughs> that was loud. Brian McKnight. Yes. Okay, David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Did I see Susan? Susan, did I see you? Susan, you didn't, yes. And Chuck Tarani says yes. Okay, so we accepted the uh, annual report. So there was a discussion also at the Water Bodies Working Group about the contract. I don't know if there's a brief update. It's still, it's still being I'm still discussed. trying to look at the details with a spy pond contract issue. We're thinking about maybe taking out the Phygmites out their SWCA contract and having another person do that, another contractor mm -hmm. do that. We also talked last night basically having some sort of environmental monitor help us manage these contracts. As is now basically it's some um, mm -hmm. catch as catch can, it's Falls of Falls and David Morgan with so many other things going on as well. So it's it's sort of not really been tightly watched, let me put it that way. And things sort of slip away. So that's one thing we're thinking about in terms of having someone hired to be responsible for sort of overseeing some of the um, work. And so one of the the very next thing, the first thing that was decided that needed to be uh, taken care of is I need to call Misty Ann Merrill and ask him if, but it seemed like there was an SWCA email today, David, and maybe uh, Naomi was going to call Misty Ann. So I kind of hung back and didn't make that phone call because you asked her if all these things from 2003 were completed. So no reply yet. 
but when that comes in, we'll know what to do. So that's the next, very next step. And what's the step after we find out that we're good to go? So maybe that gets us a little further down the lane. I think a little further down the lane, but I think we're probably going to go with SWCA mm -hmm. for the coming fiscal year. We don't have a choice because like, we still have we exactly, have a three year exactly. contract with them, and it's as you think about somebody else for the next round. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's great. Thanks for that that update. Move on. Moving on. You good? Okay. So, um, park and recreation is. Uh, we just need to know who's going to the next meeting on two eight twenty four. And I haven't been out of us three, so I can do that, I guess, if, if that's okay with uh, Nathaniel, because I know that he really likes this going there. I do. Sorry, I did. Yeah, and I thank you again, Susan, for covering for me last time. Um, on the, I'm out of the, I'm not here on the 24th, so yeah. otherwise I don't, but. I'll volunteer. That'll be my night. Thanks. Okay. okay. And I'll just and... do a quick update of the park and rec, if you'd like me to. There really did was. Did you go to the last meeting? I did. Okay. Yeah, I did. And there wasn't anything that intersects with us except for Monotomy Rocks Park, um, where there are, and Chuck, you've seen this as well, where there are, um, they're down to two options um, that they're considering for the playground. And both the options have, uh, one of them has 100% of the um, structures outside of the 50, the big structures. Um, from that wetland area um, that was recently defined back there in Monotony. Um, They're having another public meeting with these two options. Um, I believe it's on the 18th. So we'll keep posted. So you probably will have more information, Chuck, when you go to the next meeting. But that's the only project that, that's getting advanced right now that affects us, our jurisdiction. <laughs> Exactly. But you won't hear too much from me about that because they'll come from front of the Conservation Commission and that's what so really there's a project I'm just coming updated. out in Iraq Park. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be in front of the Conservation Commission uh soon. I think we already reviewed it too, because there was a the wetland scientist was from uh the Cape and it seemed like Nathaniel recognized that person's name. Um down Ryan, in that did area. you raise your hand? I, did I you saw something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just, I don't know. It's related. I, uh, the, the CPA meetings have been going on for the last three weeks. And I put in the chat the current proposed projects for CPA. If someone wants more details, I'm happy to give them. But I think the only one that's sort of wetlands related is that Monotomy Rocks playground upgrade. There are a number of others, but they're not uh, touching wetlands as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. so I think Leslie, yeah, thank you. They're probably yeah. going to think next week on um, which ones get funded. So that will be the big, the big meeting. They've got uh, three thousand, three million five hundred thousand request, or maybe two million and five hundred thousand requested, and one million five hundred thousand in available funds. So something's got to give. It's a challenge. That's it. All right. Thank you. Um, Leslie. Oh, Leslie. Leslie. <laughs> Leslie. Hello. Very late, please. I know. I just wanted to correct some information that was put out. Um, our next public meeting is February 8th on the Monotomy and Parallel Park projects. Thank you. I had the wrong day. That's okay. <laughs> but Thanks. I didn't want anyone. No, makes sense. Thank you. Miss it. Yep. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we got through park and recreation liaison. Uh, discussion we're going to go to the artificial turf and that's Mike killed this game and, and I'll be fairly brief um I will say that uh, we're making progress uh so they can tell you as well I think the uh, three subgroups of uh, health safety and environmental uh I think are making progress in terms of narrowing down our field of vision for what the individual reports are going to be uh prior to uh, submission to the town. And uh, thanks to Susan for some help on that. And I think we're also narrowing it down in terms of speakers. Uh, I have uh, identified one person who's agreed to speak, uh, and there is another one or two who may uh, come into play as well. 
uh, in terms of the environmental group that is composed of myself and uh, Joe Barr and Claire, uh, I think we're we're getting down to the main bullet points that we want to cover. Uh, obviously, given our short time frame uh, and the huge amount of information out there, it's a selection process. Uh, but I think we're making progress, so I'll leave it at that. Unless you have some questions. Okay. Um, I had some questions. I, the only thing I want to ask is when you do that, uh, when those people come in, you finally pick your uh, discussion group. Is is um, that going to be a regular meeting around five o'clock, or is that going to be something that you want to try to get more townspeople to? Uh, so it's going to be at seven or something like that. The way it's going to work is probably uh, starting at the regular five o'clock. Uh, and the way it's foreseen, as far as I know at this point, is that there will be a short introduction to the speaker in terms of that individual's expertise and experience. Uh, and then there'll be open questions for the committee. These are not going to be uh, open questions to the whole community at this point. There will be opportunities for the community to comment on draft reports. And uh, I think they are foreseeing at least one public meeting prior to the final, and then something happening towards right before town meeting when we have to submit our final report. So that's still somewhat up in the air, but that's what I recall at this point. I don't know if Leslie has any edits on that. <laughs> All right, okay. thank you. Okay. Um... So it looks like most of our items are finished off. Artificial turf is done. And the only other thing is the commission suggestion for Eagle Scout projects, but I'm we can put that off. That's not unless I don't there's has anything for trees. No, I asked. Uh Sarah, okay. would you like to uh come on and, and give us a, an update? Uh the next the, the next meeting is uh February 14th, and I gave um during our last uh, ComCom meeting, I gave a brief uh, overview of what was covered. So no news. Okay. David White, you had your hand up. So I'm in contact with the scout. I have some ideas for him. And I'll report back on what he has to say. Are there some ideas to me? I hope he gets back to me. About Do you want to have a quick discussion now? We Sure. My ideas are always good. I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on Great Meadows right now, but. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, so this whole idea was about, um, so, so scout con scouts come to us all the time and, you know, usually they're bringing in a project. So I was thinking, out, yeah, yes. I was thinking that maybe we should put a top 10 together. So when they come in, we could just say, hmm, you know, have you ever thought of these spots? So yes. if, if we don't have enough to put 10 together tonight, maybe we can just bring this to the next meeting and everyone can think about what's around town. I think about they, it yes. for next meeting. I, it's good. Yeah, I did think the bridge that he proposed at Great Meadows sounded like a great idea. And, um, you know, the walking bridge. And I thought that maybe we want to adopt, uh, and maybe there is one, who knows, and adopt a size and a construction kind of detail so we're consistent throughout town when scouts come in and say, I'm going to build something. So we know what we're getting. And if some, they only do half, then we'll have the plan and the detail to do the second half. We have a sort of standard design for um, steps at the present mm -hmm. time. Any, uh, so it looks like uh, I don't see any hands raised. So let's just put this on the next agenda and everyone think of their ideas, but if something comes up in between, David, said please reach out reach out to him yeah. so with that i'm going to ask if there are anything else from commission members that they wanted to talk about maybe something they saw around town that needs to be addressed if not i'll take a motion to adjourn so moved second. second yes let's do it wave <laughs> wave everyone wave that's all we need good night all thanks chad good night good all night. yeah didn't see David Kaplan, but okay. <laughs> we got out. We had a quorum. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>